Richard Tice is next here on Talk Radio. Online, on DAB, and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. Online and on your smart TV. Talk Radio TV News. Live at 10, I'm Nadira Tudor. Right now, no care in the world, I'm just loving life. A star is born, Britain's Emma Raducanu makes history by winning the US Open. Vaccine passports set to be scrapped as part of the Prime Minister's winter COVID plan. And animal rescue workers finally escape Afghanistan. British tennis star Emma Raducanu has made history after winning the US Open last night. She beat her Canadian opponent, Leila Fernandez, in New York without dropping a set, becoming the first British woman to win a Grand Slam in 44 years. The 18-year-old from South London, who only did her A-levels a few months ago, had to qualify to take part, making her the first qualifier to ever win a major tournament. It's an absolute dream, like, you... You just have visions of yourself, you know, going up to the box, hugging everyone, I mean, celebrating. That's something that you, you always think of and you always work for. And, and for that moment to actually happen, um, yeah, I'm just so grateful for my team that are here with me and the team that are back home and um, the LTA and every, every single person who supported me along this journey. Well, the Queen led tributes to Emma Raducanu. In a statement, she congratulated her on a remarkable achievement at such a young age and is testament to your hard work and dedication. The Prime Minister also tweeted, saying, you showed extraordinary skill, poise and guts, and we're all hugely proud of you. And... <laughs> this was the scene at her local tennis club in Beckenham, where she has played since she was six, just after she clinched the title. 
for me it just makes all the early mornings all the traipsing up and down the country the difficult conversations just the the, the grind of being a tennis coach strength and conditioning coach it's tough and and moments like this make it all worth it in other news, Boris Johnson will unveil plans to tackle coronavirus over winter this week. The Prime Minister is set to abandon compulsory COVID passports and scrap a number of special powers to impose restrictions. Earlier, the Health Secretary said the focus will be on the vaccine drive, not lockdowns. And a former Royal Marine who ran an animal shelter in Afghanistan says his staff have made it out of the country safely. Pen Farthing was forced to leave them behind when he managed to fly himself and his cats and dogs out of Kabul last month. He says 68 staff and family members have now arrived in Pakistan and he's so happy. And your weather, dry and bright for most with some sunshine at times, cloudier in the southwest with rain spreading northeast to affect western areas through the afternoon. Highs of 21 degrees. That's your live news on Talk Radio TV. More in half an hour. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. This is Talk Radio. Across the UK. Online. On DAB+. And on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Good morning and welcome to Talk Radio. And it's my show, Ty's Talk, here on Sunday, the 12th of September, a day before my next birthday. What an extraordinary weekend that we are in the middle of. I mean, yesterday, just so emotional with the powerful ceremonies, uh, the 20th anniversary of 9 11, but also so exciting with the rise of Emma Raducanu, the new British superstar, sporting superstar. And then breaking news, literally as I come on air, that the health secretary has announced, after all, we're not going to have vaccine passports. Lots going on. We've got an action-packed show. On my Sunday spotlight, I'm looking at, should we boost or not boost? The big debate, scientists not yet agreeing on that. The other, the other big debate I've got, and this will get you going, E-scooters. Yes, e-scooters. We're going to debate to scoot or not to scoot. I want your views. I think that's going to bring out the passion, bring out the enthusiasm or the anger. We'll be debating also in the first hour. Cressida Dick has been given a two-year extension to her term as Met Police Commissioner. Is she brilliant or is she useless? I want your views again. I think they'll be fairly clear one way or the other. We'll be talking about trust in the government. That's an extraordinary thing. Yes or no? Do you trust the government? I want your input, your views, your calls, your texts, your tweets. Call us 0344 499 1000. Text TALK to 87222 or tweet us at TALK Radio. And of course, you can watch us because we're a TV radio station. So download the app, uh, which is TALK Radio TV or on the website or YouTube, Apple TV, Samsung, RayQ, Rakuten, the whole lot. I've never heard of most of them. But anyway, uh, I want your views, your thoughts, so get in touch. This is, of course, Ty's Talk, and it is Talk Radio. Across the UK, online, on DAB, and on your smart speaker, this is Talk Radio. Well, good morning. It is still grey outside. At some point, the sun is going to shine when I'm actually doing the show. I've got an action-packed three hours ahead. In the third hour, we're going to be looking at uh, the lessons from... Uh, it, from the war on terror, from the 20-year uh, war on terror, reflections on the extraordinary commemorations uh, that were held in America and across the world yesterday. Some really powerful ceremonies, uh, almost bringing a tear to your eye, seeing uh, pictures of the, the loved ones, the families holding pictures uh, of, their, of their loved ones who sadly lost their lives 20 years ago. And we'll be looking forward to the lessons that we need to learn, the consequences of the decisions that were taken by the political leaders of the time. We'll never forget where we were, who we were with, when the planes hit those towers. The second hour is the big debate, the big argument, to e-scoot or not to e-scoot. I think that's gonna get you going. I want your views, your thoughts, and whether to boost or not boost the COVID jabs. But in the first hour, we have to ask 
the big, simple question. Do you trust a single word this government says? Literally, four days ago, the Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, came on to Julia's show on talk radio and said that vaccine passports were going ahead, that they were a good thing, and uh, that he was very happy to have them. And breaking news, he's just gone on another broadcast station and announced they're not going ahead. They're not going to happen after all. You know, most of us, all of us, surely, we've grown up to the idea that you can trust the government. You can trust when ministers, cabinet ministers, when the prime minister says something's going to happen or not happen. To flip-flop around like this, day in, day out, is just awful. We used to believe that you could trust the civil servants. We were told they were the envy of the world. I don't think many people believe that. So I want you to give me your views on text. Call me. Say, do you trust the government? Yes or no? Another example this week, of course, just gone, the national insurance tax rises. The biggest tax rises for about 60 years. In order, we're told, it was all briefed out, in order to fund social care. But then we discover when you look at the detail that actually, for the first three years, almost all of the money is going into trying to reduce the waiting lists on the NHS. No guarantees at all that the waiting lists will reduce. No discussion about the reforms necessary in order to get the waiting list down and then to keep them down. My, I'm ambitious. I want zero waiting lists. Zero waiting lists. So, you know, we, they're now raising this money. They said they wouldn't in their manifesto. They absolutely promised they wouldn't raise income tax, they wouldn't raise national insurance, they wouldn't raise VAT. And what have they done? They're raising income tax by the greatest increase in taxes for 60 years. How can you trust a word these people say? It's quite extraordinary. Vaccine passports, they said at the beginning of the year, they weren't going to have them. And then they've been saying for months, we are going to have them. And now we hear this morning, they're not going to have them. So what will it be next week? Will it be half in, half out? Half of you have them, half of you don't have them. Do you trust a single word this government says? Yes or no? I have to be clear with you. I have to be honest. I have to tell you, my view is no. Not a single word. For much of the time, if you actually do and believe the opposite of what they say, you'll probably end up somewhere nearer the truth. But it's reached such a farcical state of affairs that actually now I think many people may just give up. And looking on social media, on my feed this week, the number of people saying, I'm giving up with politics. It's not worth voting anymore. I'm giving up. I think that's an absolute tragedy. I think it's essential people vote. But the reason is because people are losing trust. So you tell me by, by tweet, call me, let me know your views, text me, whatever. But I want to hear from you. Simple. Do you trust this government? Yes or no? I mean, it's just... How can we carry on like this? How can, we, how can we run a country? How can we believe in our leaders? Why would we vote for our leaders? If they say one thing, they do another, and then they flip, and then they flop, and you, you just don't know whether you're half in, half out, whether you're coming, or whether you are going. I think that's sad. I think it's depressing. Politics is such an important part of all our lives. But if you can't trust the government, if you can't trust a w single word they say, then who knows? I mean, the idea was that we were going to have vaccine passports for nightclubs after Michael Gove had beautifully danced his way through the Aberdeen nightclubs uh, to show that they were safe. I mean, just extraordinary. Maybe actually they've learned the lesson from Michael Gove's uh, jaunt around the, uh, the Aberdeen nightclubs. Maybe he came back and said, we don't need the passports. It's all fine. So maybe that means that you do trust the government. They're learning the lessons. I want to hear from you. I want your thoughts, your views. For me... I'm deeply concerned because once people start losing trust in the government, then everything starts to break down. But you tell me what's your, your thoughts, your views. And coming up after the break, uh, we're going to be discussing another big contentious issue. Because yes, this week just gone, the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary, they've given a new two-year contract extended from, I think, April next year for another two years to the Commissioner of the Met Police, Cressida Dick. And we'll be discussing whether or not that was the right decision. We'll be looking at the, uh, the charge sheet against her by those who, who opposed her, uh, her extension, her reappointment. 
but I want your thoughts. Have you any experience of dealing with Cressida Dick herself or with her management team? Do you think she's brilliant or do you think she's useless and should not have been given that extension? Call me, text me, tweet me, 0344 499 1000. But for now, at 10.13, you're listening to Ty's Talk at the home of common sense, the one, the only, talk radio. Online, on DAB, and on the talk radio app. Talk radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. This is Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back. You're listening to Ty's Talk. It's 1017 on Talk Radio. And give me a call, 0344 499 1000, with your views already. The tweets are pouring in. And uh, the first one here, I don't trust a single word. Uh, various ministers say I was a natural Tory, but all trust is broken. I will never vote for them again. Lots of others, mostly clean. Keep the tweets clean and then I can read them out. Uh, one or two quite funny, but uh, shouldn't be read out on air on a Sunday morning. Well, we need to move on to discussing the Met Police Commissioner, Cressida Dick, who 
last week was given a two-year extension from uh, spring next year, just for, t for two years. But we need to discuss, and I want your views. Do you think she's good? Do you think she's brilliant? Or do you think she's useless? And the charge sheet against her is quite a long one. Uh, first of all, let's look at homicides. They've been up every year uh, in her tenure since the previous tenure, uh, by between over 20 to 60 percent. Knife crime up some 30 percent. Total crimes up by almost 20 percent. And she's been involved in a string of serious uh, issues, operations, uh, investigations that have gone badly, badly wrong. So badly wrong that there was a letter from six prominent, uh, high-profile people and celebrities who suffered or whose family members suffered at the hands of Operation Midland and Operation Yew Tree, uh, urging the Prime Minister not to grant an extension to Cressida Dick's term. But the government have decided, uh, Priti Patel and the Prime Minister, they decided, uh, and the expression they used was hardly a, a glowing reassurance, was it? They decided that in the interest of continuity, that they should extend the term. Interesting that when you think that it was the Prime Minister, when he was Mayor of London, uh, he actually forced out the then Met Police Commissioner, uh, Ian Blair, because he obviously wasn't happy with his performance. But now, uh, when he's Prime Minister, he's interested in continuity. Well, I'm delighted to be joined now by Chris Hobbs, who is a retired Metropolitan Police Officer, to get his thoughts on the pluses and minuses of uh, Cressida Dick and to, to look at this charge sheet and to give me his thoughts before I hopefully get your views. Chris, a very good morning. Thank you for joining me this Sunday. So I've read out part of the uh, part of the charge sheet there of uh, of, of the track record of Cressida Dick. Um, and you know, it does seem extraordinary. There was also the recent report, I think it was this summer, into the uh, the murder murder of Daniel Morgan in the late 80s, where uh, the report said that uh, accused the force of, uh, the, the, in respect of this case, uh, there was institutional corruption and that Cressida Dick herself had been obstructive in delaying the publication of the report. Some really serious charges. And yet the government have uh, decided that, that they want continuity. Where, where are you on this, Chris? What are your thoughts? What am I missing about the benefits of keeping Cressida Dick at, uh, at the helm? Well, strangely enough, when, uh, when on the day she was appointed, I was actually down at Sky News because I had to, uh, they wanted me to give a comment um, in terms of whether she got the job or not. And the... <laughs> It was delayed, the uh, the announcement, so I had to give two interviews, one assuming she got it and the other assuming that she didn't. Wow. Um, and so so you're very good at arguing both sides of the case absolutely. then? Absolutely. Well, <laughs> but when I heard she got it, I, I did a little jig of delight, to be quite honest. I was very pleased. Um, she was, I knew her quite well when she was commander of Operation Triton. And in actual fact, one of the attributes that she possesses is she, she does care very much about her officers. When I was uh, working to Trident, she wasn't my direct boss. Um, I was out in Jamaica working, and I got news my mother died. So I had to come rushing back, obviously. Um, and I got a very long email, unexpected, from Cressida Dick, you know, being very sympathetic, offering what su support she could. A few weeks later... A close friend of mine, an immigration officer who I work with, she committed suicide. And again, Cressida Dick found out about it, another long email. So one of the attributes she has, she cares passionately about the people under her and command. How interesting, Chris, because to back that up, funnily enough, um, just on Friday evening, I was with a retired uh, Met Police officer who said almost something very, very similar. So that clearly is one of her strengths. Yes, that's right. And, but I did say, and, and I think probably there's no doubt that her term in office hasn't gone um, as well as it might have done. There have been a lot of things that have happened during that period and before. Remember um, de Menezes, you know, that unfortunate Indeed. death. Yes. Um, but I did put it again to, to a retired officer and a serving officer the other day who I met, um, both relatives, let me hasten to add. And I said, well, you know, perhaps she hasn't gone as well. Maybe we need a new commissioner. And straight away, they jumped down my throat 
saying, well, hold on, you know, she, she really does care about her people. So that's an attribute. If you drill down into some of the criticisms that you've made, um, again, they've got to be seen in context. Now, I don't know which you want to talk about first because there's quite a few. Yeah, well, well I, I think just give me a couple of examples. But, but, but you know, I'm, the thing about leadership and, and senior management is you've got to make decisions and you've got to make judgments. And, you know, it, they're, they're often very difficult. But her track record of making big decisions and judgments on things like uh, Operation Midland and Yew Tree regarding the fantasist Carl Beach, where, you know, she could have made decisions to, to stop those investigations much, much earlier. She didn't. They went on. And, and innocent people really suffered for a I long think, time. I think one of the things about, um, you know, the, the VIPs, as it were, who, who, who did suffer... Um, was the fact that swirling around Nick, the fantasist, were, were all sorts of allegations. You might remember the, the Jeffrey Dickens dossier yes. that went missing, for example. Um, you, you might also be aware of the, uh, the recent report by the Independent Inquiry for Child Sexual Abuse that commented on these VIP allegations. And their, their conclusion was no evidence of a Westminster network. That's right. But, but there was a big but those who suffered as children from being sexually abused by individuals linked to Westminster has been just as profound. So swirling around, Nick, there, was, um, there were all sorts of other relevant factors. But you're quite right. Someone should have brought a halt to that much earlier than it did. The other issue, of course, that we've got with this problem with VIPs is that do you keep, when they're under investigation, maybe when they've been arrested, do you keep details of that quiet? until they've been charged. You see what I'm saying? So no, Completely. And, 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 and there is also this sense of, which seems to be running through the criticisms against Cressida Dick, is that there's more, she's more keen on, on essentially sort of cover-up. And there's a culture of cover-up uh, swirling around her in some of these various uh, investigations and when there's sort of um, reports into the performance of, of an operation. That seems to be a, a continuing theme uh, that troubles me deeply. Well, yes, but it, it, in terms of... Well, if we go back again to the, the VIPs and their abuse, as I say, the, the key question perhaps should be now being considered is do you go with publicity before they've been charged or do you wait till they've charged? If you wait until they've been charged, of course, the argument for putting their names in the public arena before charge is the fact that other victims will come forward and then corroborate the allegations that, that have been made. So that's, that's an issue for the politicians, for the lawmakers, but that's something that obviously um, the Met has to contend with in all these issues around sexual offences. Um, in terms of cover-up, of course, the, the Daniel Morgan happened in, in the 80s, yes. in 1987. Um, I, I looked at the report yesterday when I knew I was coming on. 460 pages, I'm afraid, defeated me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's only part Understandable. of Understandable. Yeah, that, without a doubt. Um, but yes, th things back in 1987, there's a lot of criticism about the sea not pre being preserved. All those things now have improved dramatically over the years. But then look, look OK, and then Chris, finally, if we just look recently, last year, for example, uh, we had the, uh, the leadership and management, the decisions uh, in respect of the, uh, the BLM protests last summer, uh, how the Met uh, performed over the Sarah, Sarah Everard vigil, uh, the stewarding this year of the Euro finals, the list goes on and on, and at some point there needs to be some accountability, surely, at the top. Yeah, but there's also, also I think, what, what you tend to get is, is you get this, this image of something going wrong, and it's taken out of context. Let's take Sarah Everard. Now, I wasn't there, but I know people who were. I gave an interview with Clapham Common the previous day. Again, the end result of that, yes, there was a vigil. The Met stewarded the vigil for, for six hours with mainly female officers. Gone six o'clock, after six o'clock, the idea was the vigil disperses because there were pandemic regulations. A group tried to take it over. Now, Sky News did a timeline on this, the whole incident, and they showed Met officers very politely saying, look, yeah. we've really got to pack this. And we, they showed Met officers being shouted at and abused. There were seven arrests, including the actress who was pinned face down. Yeah, and in fairness, um, in a uh, subsequent report, I think that the, uh, 
uh, yes. in that vigil that the uh, the, the Mets yes. performance was exonerated. Um, Chris, absolutely fascinating. It sounds to me that um, you're sort of uh, possibly sitting on the fence <laughs> on this issue, I think. You're possibly uh, right. <laughs> fantastic. Well, thank you very much for those thoughts uh, on whether or not Cresta Dick should have been offered uh, that, uh, that extension. That was Chris Hobbs, a retired Metropolitan Police officer. I have to say, uh, in summary, my view is that ultimately leadership has to be held to account for its performance. I think the charge sheet is too long. I think it's too serious. And I think it was time for a change. I think Londoners deserve better. So I don't think that she should have been given extension. But I want your views. What do you think at home? Should she have been offered an extension or not? Call me, uh, text me or tweet me. We've got a couple of calls before we go to the news. We've got, uh, uh, we've got Paul in Hartlepool on policing. Paul, are you there? Yeah, good morning, uh, Richard. Good Thank morning. How's, so how's Hartlepool? Is there any sun in Hartlepool? I'm very attached to Hartlepool, there's, as you know. There's, there's no sun at the moment, but what there is is sun in a certain way because there's lots of jobs and work coming in thanks to our local mayor and the changes that have taken place up here. Every time I pick up the paper, there's another 50 jobs here and 50 jobs there. That's fantastic so, news. Um, I think we're definitely moving in the right direction. And just as a final thing for Hartlepool, there's a huge amount of up, uh, untapped talent up here. So people come and have a look. There's tradesmen Perfect. Well, and skills up here. I, I know that. I can vouch for that from the time that I've spent in Hartlepool. What are your thoughts, Paul, on policing and Cressida Dick? Well, uh, my take on this, uh, Richard, is that her competence, incompetence is breathtaking. Quite how she's allowed to get away with this all the time, I don't know. Whether it's middle and yew tree, even the dawn butler stop. That was either legal or it wasn't. If it was legal, come out and support your officers 100%. The demonstrations and the way they were dealt with last year was appalling. The murders, we've not under, got under control. And even the spotters. Your previous guy was talking about spotters. Um, sorry, the vigil. I don't think that was dealt with in a good way at all. No, I'm, why I'm, did they ever, I'm, ever I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that, Paul. Um, but, uh, but that is what the report said at the end of it. It sounds like, Paul, that you are with me on this. Um, I just... <laughs> Only in the interest of time, Paul. I'm very grateful for the call. Please do call again from I'll hopefully... i just say one quick thing, Richard. Go for it, Paul. Part of, the, part of the problem also is the College of Policing. It's a quango. It's yes. almost like the House of Lords. It's a daycare centre for failed police officers. Paul, I've, I've, come... I've, I've absolutely heard that before, and we should come back to that, and we'll get you back on. Uh, I must go to the news. The time is 10.30. You're listening to Ty's Talk on Talk Radio. Online and on your smart TV. Talk Radio TV News. With your headlines, I'm Nadira Tudor. Right now, no care in the world. I'm just loving life. A star is born. Britain's Emma Raducanu makes history by winning the US Open. Maxine passports set to be scrapped as part of the Prime Minister's winter COVID plan. And animal rescue workers finally escape Afghanistan. British tennis star Emma Raducanu has made history after winning the US Open last night. She beat her Canadian opponent, Leila Fernandez, in New York without dropping a set, becoming the first British woman to win a Grand Slam in 44 years. It's an absolute dream. Like You, you just have visions of yourself, you know, going up to the box, hugging everyone, I mean, celebrating. That's something that you, you always think of and you always work for. And, and for that moment to actually happen... Um, yeah, I'm just so grateful for my team that are here with me and the team that are back home and um, the LTA and every, every single person who supported me along this journey. Well, the Queen led tributes to Emma Raducanu in a statement. She congratulated her on a remarkable achievement at such a young age and is testament to your hard work and dedication. The Prime Minister also tweeted saying you showed extraordinary skill, poise and guts and we're all hugely proud of you. In other news, Boris Johnson will unveil plans to tackle coronavirus over winter this week. The Prime Minister is set to abandon compulsory COVID passports and scrap a number of special powers to impose restrictions. And a former Royal Marine who ran an animal shelter in Afghanistan says his staff have made it out of the country safely. Pen Farthing was forced to leave them behind when he managed to fly himself and his cats and dogs out of Kabul last month. He says 68 staff members have now arrived in Pakistan. This is news on Talk Radio TV. More in half an hour.
This is Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk on Talk Radio at 10.33. Well, the tweets are pouring in. I think it's fair to say most people don't trust the government. Uh, but we've got one here on Cressida Dick, who Carl from Wirral says uh, should go and take her woke partisan policing with her. Uh, another one says, uh, this is like listening to Texas radio uh, with an evangelical preacher. I'm not sure whether he is referring to Boris Johnson or whether I'm the evangelical preacher. Who knows? But anyway, maybe Josephine in Dorset, who's the next caller, uh, has a view on that. Josephine, good morning. Thanks for dialing in this Sunday. How are we doing? Good morning to you, and thank you for taking the call. Uh, yes, can we trust the government? Well, I, I must admit, I was uh, worried when Johnson was put in charge because he seems to be such a weather vane. And, you know, people say, oh, he's a laugh, he's a joker, he's a clown. Well, trouble is, we've got a pandemic. We've got a situation in Afghanistan, which, absolutely, you know, we don't need a laugh, a joker, a clown in charge. We want somebody who actually knows what they're doing. We want a competent leader. That's absolutely sure. the, the description I use, Josephine, is that he's like a brilliant salesman. And actually, the truth is, all of us, I think we all like a salesman. Uh, and that's why he's been so successful in politics. Would you agree with that? Yes, it, 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 it's an image. It's just a sort of a, you know, a, a, oh, trust me, I'm a, I'm a really good bloke. I don't know what I'm doing, but, you know, just, just trust me anyway. Interesting. Well, you see, I also say there are so many frailties in Boris Johnson, his multiple frailties, that actually all of us can see some of our own frailties, because if we're honest, we've all got them. Everybody can see one of their own frailties somewhere yeah, but, in Boris. But when you're Prime Minister, you know, you need a bit more you've, now. You've, a bit more... You, you've hit it on the head. We need strong, principled, clear leadership. Josephine, thank you very much for those thoughts on the leadership of the Prime Minister. Well, uh, we're now going to uh, just shift a little bit and go to our next guest, because uh, I talked last week about uh, some length about whether or not uh, the government should follow the advice of their own experts. They always said they would listen to uh, the JCVI and their decision as to whether or not to vaccinate 12 to 15 year olds. And this week ahead of us, we're expecting a decision from the chief medical officer, Professor Chris, Chris Whitty, as to whether or not uh, he is prepared to recommend to the health service secretary to overrule that advice, overrule that expertise, overrule their judgment, uh, in the interests of children's mental health, their education, their ability to socialise. Um, but behind the scenes, uh, there is actually quite a bit going on. Uh, I believe there's a 12 and a 16-year-old uh, youngsters who are actually suing the government or about to sue the government in the event that they make that decision to recommend uh, vaccinating 12 to 15-year-olds. So I'm delighted to be joined by Stephen Jackson, who is the solicitor acting uh, on their behalf, uh, I believe with obviously uh, parental assistance. Stephen, a very good morning to you this Sunday. And uh, just um, my, my listeners and viewers are probably completely unaware that this case is uh, is sort of in the background. So it'd be really good just to sort of un to understand um, w what it is, uh, how it works. And in the event that Chris Ritchie does make that judgment, um, What's the timing of events that may flow from that? OK, well, the case is brought by um, two sisters, 12 and 16, and they're acting through their mother because, of course, they can't act for themselves because, of course, they don't have the uh, necessary, um, or the court would consider, they don't have the necessary ability, competence to bring the case, which is quite interesting given they might be required to have the competence to take a... a uh, Indeed experimental new drug but nevertheless moving on the case is this was brought by those two young girls um and it is essentially to say the rollout of these vaccines needs to be put on pause um the essential thing is what is the emergency if there's no emergency then there's no legal basis on which to push out uh, roll out these vaccines in any event so that's point one even if there should be an emergency among the population generally, and even if children might be considered for the vaccination, what is the benefit of the vaccine for them? So we stop then. There is no benefit. So please pause. Even if 
uh, we have to go further. Well, what's the other side of things? What might there be a risk or a harm that we need to think about that we should stop these vaccines and just pause for a moment? And on that, there is plenty of evidence of an increasing evidence of harms which might arise for the children. Really, quite serious evidence. So, so, that, also, so, that, that the, so the idea of the case is to is to press the pause button, and and how do they, uh, yes, how do they do that? Well, it's easy for the court to say. Actually, so we look at the process you've been used and we say that there is no emergency, therefore actually the rollout must the, the uh, must be stopped immediately. So I say pause. There's always time for the uh, MHRA who authorise these uh, vaccines, JCBI who recommend their use, and the Secretary of State who makes the decisions. There's always time to look back, find new, um, safer way of looking after the population and give a new decision. But this one's been made should be stopped, at least paused until it's rethink, is it the right decision being made? So it's, it, that's a very interesting way of putting it, that actually essentially looking for more data, because um, my recollection of the JCVI statement uh, is actually that they wanted uh, more data in order to understand uh, the, uh, in a sense, the, the balance of risk reward ratio. And, and well, obviously, yeah. more data comes with more time. Exactly right, Richard. I mean, what they actually said on the 19th of July was the first published statement uh, which we're considering, which is, and the JCVI said this, they said, until more data become available, JCVI does not currently advise routine you know, universal vaccination of children and young people less than 18 years of age. So we're not just talking about 12 to 15, we're also talking about 16 to 17 year olds as well. So all the all children, young people under under 18, the JCVI, JCVI said very clearly, wait, we need more data before rolling out these vaccines. And nothing has changed in the data since then, apart from more data to make us think even more carefully. And so um, if if Professor Chris Whitty makes that recommendation and it's, it's uh, taken up by uh, the health secretary, you'd be bringing your case when? So the week after this this coming week? Well, the case is already issued. Uh, we actually issued back on the 2nd of September, and we did what was fairly common in any case where there's something is about to happen, and you can apply to the court and you seek what's called an injunction. Basically, you ask the court to step in and order a pause of the rollout. Right. Now, that's only temporary, and it could be for just seven days, whatever it is, just to have a quick, quick look and say, should we be thinking a little bit before we go ahead, before we press the button. And the court is really quite, is um, can do that and frequently does do that in ordinary cases. And, and, and just to finish off, uh, Stephen, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I talked last week about a possible middle ground, because as I understand at the moment, it's actually not lawful to vaccinate uh, healthy children, 12 to 15 year olds, uh, unless they've got um, certain conditions. Um, but of course, there are many parents uh, who do want to vaccinate their children. I wonder whether we get to some middle way, because I worry about the the division, the angst that this is going to cause on both sides of the debate. I wonder whether there's a middle way where it, it's it's allowed to be, it's made lawful, but that the government puts out all the evidence, all the pros and cons, but says to parents, look, on this, there is there is disagreement amongst the scientists in the same way that economists often disagree. Um, and therefore we'll make it lawful but we're not yet recommending it. And I wonder whether that would sort of diffuse some of the angst and the, the emotion and the, the frustration that's building up on both sides of the debate. Yes, to be clear, this isn't an anti-vaccine case. This is very specific to looking at the pros and cons of these particular COVID-19 vaccinations. Now, even if the court says, yes, quite right, we should pause this because looking at these uh, the harms which we can see, and it's, we simply do not know, because it's a new technology that's being used, we simply do not know what's going to happen in the medium or long term. Even if the court says, yes, let's pause, or even let's, let's um, not allow the authorization generally, these vaccines can still be prescribed to the children who need it. Yes. It's not yes. going to stop prescription for the very vulnerable children for whom this vaccine might be of benefit. An authorised prescriber can still give it to the patient to fulfil a special need. Those are the legal words for it. Right. But essentially, 
if a child is going to benefit, and that's the key, there is going to be a net benefit, which that isn't for most children, but it might be for the occasional very vulnerable child, the vaccines can still be allowed. Indeed. We're not stopping that. Fantastic. Well, look, um, Stephen, thank you so much for that explanation. Uh, I'm sure my listeners and viewers are interested to know uh, the uh, what is going on in the background uh, in the event that uh, the Health Secretary does decide to overrule the JCVI. Thank you for that. That was Stephen Jackson, the solicitor acting for a 12 and 16 year old who are potentially taking the government to court. Well, uh, the time is 10.40, almost 10.44. This is Ty's Talk at the home of Common Sense, of course. It's Talk Radio. Online, on DAB and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. This is Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk on Talk Radio. It's 10.47 and the tweets are coming in thick and fast about trust in the government. And I have to say, it's probably over 90% uh, with no trust in this government. 
But we need to move on to some exciting news. We have a new superstar, a new British superstar, Emma Raducanu, who uh, won the US Open last night. I'm sure many of you watched it. I did. I mean, it was unbelievable. End-to-end -end stuff, side-to-side, diagonal-to-diagonal. I almost got dizzy watching it. And the, the best headline this morning, I, I will admit I'm not a regular Sunday People uh, reader, but their headline uh, is amazing. Uh, Radu, can you believe it? Uh, which is a great play on letters. And I'm delighted to be joined now by the Talk Sports tennis correspondent, Lisa O'Sullivan, uh, to talk about this extraordinary achievement and the implications. Lisa, a very good morning to you. What do you make of this? I mean, how significant is this and how big a star could could Emma Raducanu become? Well, I mean, she's already massive, isn't she? I think they're talking about the fact that she could be taking in around £25 million worth of sponsorship this month alone. Wow. But she, from a tennis point of view, she's just inspirational. And there are so many younger women um, that sometimes fall out of the game when they're around 15, 16 years old that I think will be inspired to stay and keep playing um, because... This 18-year-old has just done the most amazing thing. And not just her, you know, Leila Fernandez, the 19th, so two months older than Emma Raducanu, right. 19 years old, she played her part in that final as well. And I think it was one of the most exciting women's finals I've seen for, well, uh, decades. For sure. And I tweeted out, you know, how well she had played. And in the second set, Lisa, actually Leila Fernandez showed incredible courage. She came back from a couple of championship points and then really put pressure back on uh, Raducanu, didn't she? Yeah, and she'd done that all the way through the championship. She had seemed to have been down and out in a lot of the matches. She had match um, Naomi Osaka, so two-time US Open champion, had match points. Leila, Leila Fernandez took off her and then dumped her out. She took out three of the top five and the three-time champion, uh, three-time Grand Slam champion, Angelique Kerber. So Fernandez was just phenomenal throughout the whole two weeks. And to have her on one side of the draw and Emma Raducanu heading towards her on the other side of the draw just made it completely different to anything that we've seen before. And, and is it right, I think I heard, that um, no one's ever come into a, a major tournament, a Grand Slam tournament, as a qualifier and gone on to win? No, male or female, it's never happened before. Male or... It is just so, so, so Im improbable that you'd be able to get through three matches in qualifying and then win another seven. And to do it without dropping a set as well, that's the thing, that she just did it in such great style. I mean, it is, it is such inspirational stuff. And as you quite rightly say, in a sense, I mean, I, I did chuckle at um, the, uh, uh, the person handing over the cheque, the winning cheque for over $2 million dollars. Um, yeah. to, uh, to Emi Raducanu. Um, it was almost as though she whispered in her ear, but we're investment managers, we can invest it for you. But actually, the much more significant thing is, is the inspiration that you've just mentioned there, Lisa, on other young, uh, young women, uh, teenagers, you know, who are brilliant in the game or approaching brilliance to stay with it because actually this is what you can achieve if you really work incredibly hard. Yeah, absolutely. And Raducanu could have gone out in the second round of qualifying. That was one of the toughest matches she played until she got to the final. And she didn't. She dug deep. And, and again, with Fernandez as well, they both just showed grit and hard work as well. That's the other thing. Yes, both these women are very talented players, but well, they've worked very, very hard and well, they're very dedicated to their sport to do that. Well, Lisa, that's fantastic. And what a great way to finish on just talking about um, dedication, hard work uh, to... Uh, two late teenagers uh, who've clearly got incredible prospects ahead of them. Lisa O'Sullivan, thank you very much for that and, and really exciting prospects for both those players. But uh, a new British superstar uh, is with us. Well, uh, just before we get to the top of our, we've got a couple of calls. Uh, do keep the calls coming in 0344 499 1000. Uh, but talking about trust in the government, going back to trust, that great word. I've got Lenny in Ashford. I'm assuming that's Ashford in Kent. Lenny, good morning. What are your thoughts? Well, it is, you, know, you are correct, uh, uh, Richard. Uh, what it is, I, I was a Conservative all my life until I dealt with the Conservatives. And in Ashford, we have a Conservative MP and a Conservative Council. But what Ashford itself has a reputation as the town of 40 feet. And I have experienced what that means. And what it is, I have documentary evidence 
that if I could find someone that I could trust, I would love to expose on on the double standards of a conservative. Okay, so so you your experience are at both at local level as well as at national level uh, of the conservatives doesn't sound great there, Lenny, and that's that no. is Ashford in Kent, is it? That is Ashford in Kent. Got it. Got it. Well, um, there you are. That's Lenny uh, with his thoughts on trust, and uh, we've got. Um, uh, I think we've got another call uh, who's not quite ready, but um, uh, yeah. I'm just going to take you through some of the uh, some of the tweets. Actually, the previous discussion I just had about the solicitor acting for uh, the two um, two children who are suing the government. Uh, someone's tweeted in, "What can we do to help those uh, that case?" Uh, we'll I'll put something on my uh, Twitter feed as to where to find out more about that case. Uh, and I think just looking at uh, another tweet here. Uh, it says, I don't trust a single word that Johnson, Gove, uh, Zahawi say I was a natural Tory, but all trust is broken. I shall never vote for them again. This is these are strong words. And I think we've got Dave uh, from Essex uh, on the line to talk about his views. Maybe, Dave, you trust the government and you think Boris is a fantastic prime minister. Uh, Mr. Tice, on both of those counts, uh, what I think uh, you couldn't say on radio. Well, please don't. Um, it's a no. I won't, but uh, all I say to you is this, is um, they're going to wait for the Dictatorship uh, Act to go through Parliament again for another six uh, months, and then they're going to reimpose these these uh, passports. Uh, because they, they knew the other day that the feeling in Parliament was they weren't going to get it through Parliament on a vote. So once once Boris Johnson, our, our glorious dictator, gets that act reimposed for six months, I guarantee you, and everyone who's listening, that those passports are going to come in. And, and I'll guarantee you that. I'll put a 10 on that. I'll give you a bet. Well, that? <laughs> I'm not sure we can bet live on air, but you never know. We might we might do that. I, I, to be honest, I think we're, we're in such an extraordinary situation, aren't we, where literally every three or four days the position changes. Yeah. So it may yeah. not be next March. It might be next week. It might be next month. Who knows? No. But you, you just sort of know that whatever they say today is very likely to change. You could take the view that... Uh, you know that the uh, the whole COVID crisis is is constantly evolving and changing, and they have to respond with it. You could try and be generous, but I I think generosity with uh, with this government's decision making, I think we've probably um, uh, used all our generosity. Uh, it sounds like you have, Dave. Yeah, I, I'll never vote. Well, I didn't vote before, but all I say to you, please stand in Essex and as many seats as you can, because we have got some horrible. Uh, detestable Conservative MPs, especially where I live in South End. We need to get rid of these people because they have got no interest in the people at all but for themselves. But I guarantee you now, Mr Tice, that passport is going to come in. And there when it are. does, I shall come on your show and say to you... Well, you're already on the show and I think it's quite clear what you, your view is, yeah. Dave. Yeah. Um, thank yeah. you very much for those thoughts. Well, there we are. Uh, Dave from near South End, his view is quite clear that uh, he can't trust the government. Uh, he's not going to say, li thankfully, live on air, but his view is that vaccine passports will come back. Look, I'm prepared to accept that uh, the crisis evolves and you get different variants and we have to be prepared uh, You know th that something may change. And we, we know as we come into the winter, who knows, there might be a, a bad flu epidemic. Who knows, there might be a different variant and they have to respond to that. But actually, vaccine passports is a question of principle. It's a question of political choice. Uh, I don't think that actually has got anything to do with variants. We know that, um, I've been double jabbed, we know that even if you've had the vaccine, the reality is it doesn't stop transmission and it doesn't stop the possibility of you being infected. Well, we're approaching the top of the hour. You're listening to Ty's Talk here on Talk Radio. Online on DAB and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
online and on your smart TV. Talk Radio TV News. Live at 11, I'm Nadira Tudor. Right now, no caring the world, I'm just loving life. A star is born. Britain's Emma Raducanu makes history by winning the US Open. The Health Secretary confirms plans for vaccine passports in England have been axed. And animal rescue workers finally escape Afghanistan. British tennis star Emma Raducanu has made history after winning the US Open last night. She beat her Canadian opponent, Leila Fernandez, in New York without dropping a set, becoming the first British woman to win a Grand Slam in 44 years. The 18-year-old from South London, who only did her A-levels a few months ago, had to qualify to take part, making her the first qualifier to ever win a major tournament. It's an absolute dream, like, you... You just have visions of yourself, you know, going up to the box, hugging everyone, I mean, celebrating. That's something that you, you always think of and you always work for. And, and for that moment to actually happen, um, yeah, I'm just so grateful for my team that are here with me and the team that are back home and um, the LTA and every, every single person who supported me along this journey. Well, the Queen led tributes to Emma Raducanu in a statement. She congratulated her on a remarkable achievement at such a young age and is testament to your hard work and dedication. The Prime Minister also tweeted, saying you showed extraordinary skill, poison guts, and we're all hugely proud of you. And... <laughs> this was the scene at her local tennis club in Beckenham, where she has played since she was six, just after she clinched the title. In other news, plans to introduce vaccine passports in England have been scrapped. They were set to be made mandatory for entry into nightclubs and other large events at the end of this month. But earlier, the Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, confirmed it will no longer happen, saying we shouldn't be doing things for the sake of it. I think most people probably instinctively don't like the idea. I mean, I, I've never liked the idea of saying to people, you must show your papers or something to, to do you know, what, what is just an everyday activity. But we were right to, you know, to properly look at it, to look at the evidence. But you're not uh, doing but, it. Well, what I can say is that we've looked at it properly. And whilst we should keep it in reserve as a potential option, I'm pleased to say that we will not be going ahead. And a former Royal Marine who ran an animal shelter in Afghanistan says his staff have made it out of the country safely. Pen Farthing was forced to leave them behind when he managed to fly himself and his cats and dogs out of Kabul last month. He says 68 staff and family members have now arrived in Pakistan and he's so happy. And your weather, dry and bright for most, with some sunshine at times, cloudier in the southwest, with rain spreading northeast to affect western areas through the afternoon, highs of 21 degrees. So live news on Talk Radio TV, more in half an hour. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. This is Talk Radio. Across the UK, online, on DAB+, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Tice Talk here on Talk Radio. It's 11.03. The weather is improving a little bit outside from Talk Radio Towers. And some of the tweets coming in also uh, are, are, are a little bit more friendly. Uh, there's one here I quite like. Uh, I like you because there's no spin involved. Uh, the government doesn't seem sincere and I get the feeling they're just following the party line of the week. Well, we had lots of passion about trust in the government, uh, lots of calls, lots of tweets in the first hour. And I'm, I'm absolutely certain that our next topic is going to equally generate lots of passionate uh, views both sides because I have my first big head to head debate. And what better topic to start it on than the question of uh, these relatively new uh, machines, devices uh, that have appeared on our roads, uh, e-scooters. And so I'm. Uh, the question is whether or not uh, they're a good thing, whether they're a bad thing, should we keep them, should we ban them? Is there a middle ground? And so it's fantastic to be joined by an advocate uh, for, for e-scooters, Ollie Chadwick, who is the managing director of uh, company Electric Zoom, and then in the anti-camp, I'm delighted to be joined by Sarah Gayton from the National Federation for the Blind. Both of you, a very good morning. Thanks 
for joining us here on Talk Radio to talk about this really crucial thing because actually e-scooters are appearing uh, in many cities across the country. I think there are trials uh, in, in 40 to 50 different cities. So, you know, they are a thing. And, uh, and also the rules are really quite confusing out there. I think it's legal to have trials, but as I understand, whilst it's legal uh, to own a an e-scooter, a private one, uh, it's not legal to use them on the road. So, you know, go figure. Anyway, uh, welcome to you both. And um, Ollie Chadwick, I'm going to start with you. So, uh, tell us why they're a good thing, given the huge campaign that's building uh, against e-scooters, even though they're still in a trial period. Um, it, it sort of feels that um, the campaign against them is louder than, than the proponents. So the electric scooter phenomenon has been around for a few ne- years now, starting in America, uh, has worked its way across Europe, and now the UK has, has embraced and adapted to them. At the moment, we've got the rental uh, the rental schemes in place in different towns and cities, and that's the government's way, effectively, of trialling them. Uh, now, the rentals have got their own sort of associated issues. What we want is to see privately owned scooters, the ones which we retail legalise, um, in the same way that we've got electric bikes and normal bikes across our towns and cities. You know, we're moving with the times. Uh, you know, we, we're very aware of the environmental impacts. And we need to find new innovative forms of transport. Is always going to be teething problems when, when you bring new innovations around, but you need to have clear regulation in place for both the rider uh, and wider stakeholders, uh, you know, to benefit everybody. And that's really interesting, Ollie, because actually um, I put out a Twitter poll earlier this morning, and we've had almost a thousand votes. And, and the question I asked was, uh, ban them, keep them, or keep them but regulate. And I think what you've just said is. Uh, that we need to learn from the trials and regulates. But Sarah, uh, good morning to you. Uh, what are your thoughts on, uh, it sounds like you're an advocate uh, for not keeping them at all. Um, tell us why, uh, as opposed to learning from the uh, the lessons of the trials. Well, good morning, Richard. Well, the e-scooters are just absolutely sort of terrifying and terrorising pedestrians on the pavements, both rentable ones and the illegal e-scooters. <clears throat> You know, the riders don't want to come off there. You know, some are on the road, but they're just whizzing in and out of pedestrians and and causing quite a lot of stress and distress. But also the rentable ones are also being left on the pavement, parked on the pavement, strewn all over the pavement that causes trip hazard and and obstruction. So we can't see there's been any place for these e-scooters. Now we know the rentable ones are under legislation, but it's like a a free-for-all it's like the wild west you know so they're not actually um abiding by those rules and regulations so you know and for people people know those e-scooters the private ones are illegal and they're using them all over the street all over the pavement whizzing through pedestrian areas so they can't even behave now when they're not allowed on the road so what is going to happen if they do become legalised? Well, um, that, that's, a, that's a really good point. And certainly from my experience, you know, you're absolutely right. There are lots of private ones being used. And, you know, we all want lower emissions, uh, you know, quieter cities. And so in that sense, uh, they potentially have a, uh, a role to play. When I was thinking about this, and I'm going to ask you both this question, actually. Um, if you started from a clean sheet of paper, imagine there were no motorbikes, no mopeds, no bicycles, no e-scooters, and they all appeared on the same day uh, as a new innovation. I'm sort of wondering, would we be recommending the bicycles and the e-scooters, but not the mopeds and the the noisy motorbikes? Ollie, what's your thought on that? Well, I mean, in sort of answer to that, there was a study by the the OECD who found that in the urban environment, uh, you know, a scooter or a bicycle, they both sort of class them to pose the same risk, they're as safe as each other, um, pose a far lesser risk to the pedestrians than a motor vehicle or a car. Um, you know, in towns and cities, a study by INRAX found that 67% of car journeys are less than three miles. 18% of those are less than one. So we need to find, uh, you know, a solution. And, uh, you know, we were talking about electric cars, et cetera. But actually, that doesn't necessarily solve a lot of the problem because that still has the congestion. People want to get places quicker, faster. Uh, and the electric uh, and electric bikes and all forms of um, PLEVs personal like electric vehicles need to be embraced and adapted. Um, but, you know, I, I think there needs to be regulation in place. Um, a point Sarah mentioned um, with the rentals, they are, they, they get the issue where they're dumped. 
Um, now you wouldn't have that with privately owned scooters if somebody's bought one with their own money. Um, actually, a lot of the companies who run these rentals also have, a, a, you know, bike rental firms. You know, we've got those, we've got forest bikes, electric bikes. Now they pose no more of a risk for, for the blind or partially blind than the scooters do. Um, what I you know, think we need, just as you do with a car or, or, or a motorbike is, is regulation in place. So if somebody does breach those rules, they, they are punished appropriately. And so Sarah, um, regulation, uh, is it possible to have the appropriate regulation, possibly some really strict uh, sanctions for people who break the rules and regulations? Uh, would that overcome the situation? Because in a sense, um, are, are e-scooters any worse than bicycles, which are, which are equally quiet uh, and indeed in many cases faster than e-scooters? Well, there's regulation now, Richard, and they're not behaving. <laughs> they're biding on the pavement. They're terrorising people. They're leaving them on controlled crossings. They're leaving them all strewn everywhere, tipped over, you name it. That You can be found everywhere, these e-scooters. So the regulations are strict under the trials, and it's not working. You know, so And there is a complete difference between a bicycle and an e-scooter. Just look at the, the shape of it. You know, An e-scooter is like a skateboard with a pogo stick attached to it. What a wonderful description. Oh, <laughs> the balance of it, I mean, you put, look at it, just look at that machine and think, are you really going to put your life, your future life in the hands of that machine? Not sort of quite a few people are not wearing helmets, you know, the small wheels, you hit a curb, you hit a pothole, where are you going to go? But, but you know, Sarah, so, 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 but Sarah, you've talked about people breaching the regulations, but if there's no sanctions, but if there was a, a big fine for using it on the pavement, if you regulated the speed, and it sounds like Ollie is 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 pro sensible regulation and we can debate what sensible is but but sarah would you accept them if they were if they were sufficiently a, a sufficient appropriate speed with some really serious financial sanctions w would that uh, w would that be good for you absolutely not because again you can't catch them you know they're, they're so fast even if a you reduce the speed they're still a lot faster than somebody can walk you know and they're still terrifying so, so you are you are you are the lady who is absolutely under no circumstances for turning uh you are rock solid on on that principle it sounds like ollie um just talk to me please about the speed uh i think i'm right in saying that the the higher vehicles have a limitation of about 11 or 12 miles an hour it, and um, what sort of speeds do the private ones go up to so the rental ones, yeah, do have limitations and some of them have, have sort of what they call geofencing. So certain areas that that's limited even further, but it's about between 12 and a half to 15 miles an hour. And to be honest, the vast majority of the private ones also come in at the same speed. You know, you can get faster ones, um, but, um, you know, same with, with electric bikes. Now I find, you know, Sarah, some of Sarah's points are a little confusing, you know, just has this blanket ban, you know, no e-scooters. You know, we live in a times where, in the UK especially, isn't it? innovative country there's always going to be teething problems but you know uh, as is with you know the car you know we didn't used to have speed limits on the on the motorway that's coming to force you know we've now got strict punishment for people being on their phones so you know they, they can be regulated and actually in germany they are the people have got little license plates on them and, and what, so you know so, there are ways uh, so what speed would you think would be fair and appropriate uh, if they were to be continued at the end of the trials ollie we'd say 15 and you'd, a half you'd say now, 15 which, and which um, and what is which the is the legal speed for the same as electric bikes at the minute, which are you know perfectly legal to use in, in towns or cities or, or wherever. Um, which, but but equally would probably go uh, go faster, and I haven't <laughs> really referred to it. And when do the trials end? So they've been pushed back a little bit because of COVID. So they're due to end. There's a government uh, committee report that came out. They're due to end uh, March 2022. 22. So another six months. So um, Sarah, you've got another six months of the trials. Um, and I think, have you just put in a petition or about to put in a petition to the government or a consultation? Oh, definitely. We were on, we went to number 10 on Thursday this week to actually ask for the trials to be halted because we found shocking condition of the rentable e-scooter tyres on the pavements. You know, there's the tread on the tyre looks sort of unfit for purpose because it's been worn away. I'm just in Nottingham now and it's actually, you know, the, the rubber's gone and you're down to another part of the wheel. It's really, truly shocking, the state of them. But, but Sarah, once... is that, but, and, and, but playing devil's advocate, is that any different to the tread on a cycle tyre? Uh, does it, does that, how, how, much, is, how much does that matter is, if you're only going 10 or 12 miles an hour? It matters a huge amount. 
you know, these are motor vehicles and they're regulated under the DFT that clearly states they have to be fit for purpose. They have to have no defects. Well, and you know? and if, so, if, you're, if you're watching on, uh, on, on the TV app or whatever, uh, we've got some pictures that Sarah put in of uh, of tyres that that are worn away. So, so I, okay. So, so your view is the tyres uh, do make a difference. Um, Ollie, is this all things that can be uh, can be dealt with in regulation? And is six, do we still need another six months or seven months to March twenty two, uh, or, or or do we learn enough lessons by let's say the, you know the end of this year? Well, obviously, we, we want them to come into to regulations and, and use sooner than that. But obviously, I mean, that particular example what was a rental scooter. Now, we want the privately owned to be legalised. Now, those with a private scooter who've paid, you know, three, four hundred pounds for one, um, cheaper than the equivalent electric bike, is going to take far better care of them. They're not going to be dumped in the street in town, which the rentals have that issue. Um, you know, they are going to have appropriate tyres on them because it's their, you know, their, their cherished product, if you like. Um, I, I'm just wondering if Sarah has any statistics or any of these 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 claims she's made or any any well, she's going to 10 Downing Street to bring them. If she got any statistics behind it, it would be interesting just to know from my personal view. Well, um, I, I'm sure that uh, she can uh, put this on social media or something. Uh, time is running against us, uh, Sarah and Ollie, but I'm going to thank both of you for your passionate, clear views on whether or not to keep them, uh, regulate them or ban them and the twitter poll at the moment says that 50 percent says to ban them uh about 11 percent says keep them and about 40 percent uh 39 percent says keep them but regulate them so ollie and sarah thank you very much for your thoughts uh your passion on that uh which was great i will declare my hand now which is that in order to understand a bit more i actually used a higher one about a week ago uh to see what they were like and um, I thought the experience was interesting. Actually, they went at about 10 or 11 miles an hour. And I have to say, I was overtaken by lots of people on Boris bikes. I'm a competitive sort of chap, and I found that rather frustrating. But anyway, um, I think with regulation uh, that uh, they can be a good thing. But tell me your views, your thoughts. 0344 499 1000. Keep them, regulate them, or ban them. You're listening to Ty's Talk. It's 11.17, and this is Talk Radio. Online. On DAB and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
This is Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. The time is 11.21. This is Ty's Talk on Talk Radio. We've just had my first big head-to-head debate on e-scooters. And coming up in the second half of this hour, we've got another big, passionate topic to boost or not to boost with the vaccines. Will you take a booster or not? I'll be looking forward for your views. But we've had already lots of thoughts and tweets on the issue of e-scooters. Uh, uh, one here from, uh, from I think... Uh, Someone, I can't quite read that, uh, says the clean version of my opinion on e-scooters is, in a word, dangerous. And if regulated, needs to be regulated by someone who is not a job's worth or a psycho. Well, there we are. That's pretty clear. Uh, Andrew says, he tweets in, I regularly see scooters on the road, uh, on the pavement, in the park, zooming past at speeds of up to 30 miles an hour. Well, I don't know if they do go that fast. Maybe the speed seems faster. But it does seem to me that this is... Uh, a, 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 something that's really changing very fast, lots of views, and uh, there is clearly a need to regulate. Now, we've got a caller, Rudy in Exeter, on e-scooters. Rudy, good morning to you. Thanks for calling. So you heard, I think, the debate there. Uh, where are you on e-scooters? Have you ever used one? No, but they're dangerous. But my point is this. They're not going to implement a huge fines. You've got cyclists going through red lights, cycling on pavements. No one does anything. It's just a free-for-all. So they're not going to do it with, with e-scooters. So they can't even do it with cyclists. So just let them get away with blue murder. That's a really interesting point, really, because literally during the break, I was just writing down the, the things that you might need to regulate. And I was thinking exactly that, that in a sense, you shouldn't discriminate against e-scooters if you don't actually regulate the way that cyclists uh, use, use the roads as well. Because, you know, I mean, I, I, I use a road bike. I cycle, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there are some cyclists uh, who are a danger not only to themselves, but also, uh, you know, to other road users, to car drivers and everything. So um, I guess it's a question of, of how they're regulated and what are the sanctions, Rudy? I mean, I, they let me... can't implement the sanctions because they're not implementing the sanctions on cyclists. Correct. So, so it's... Do on scoot- scoot- OK, so get... let's just chew over that then, Rudy. So in a sense, at the moment, of course, you see, you don't need to register uh, bicycles, whether they're normal bikes or uh, e-bikes. Um, uh, so maybe, you know, if you're going to register uh, with some form of number plate uh, e-scooters, and indeed all, all the higher trials, I think they do have some form of number plate. Maybe you should do the same with bikes. That way you could then at least know uh, who who owns it, uh, and then uh, there's a there's a chance of, of sanctions. But it, it, it's not easy as if someone jumps through a light or uh, is on a pavement. It, it is not easy to, uh, to 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 impose the sanctions. I guess unless you've got it on uh, on some form of CCTV footage or whatever. But the, but the point is right. That like with cyclists, right? They're doing it day in day out, and then you get the traffic warden saying we can't implement it. It's nothing to do with us. It's the police, and the police don't do anything about it. So it's like who is responsible for it? You know, and even when we've spent millions and millions of pounds on psychopaths, even when I was in White City recent, recently by the BBC building the psychopaths, they're still all cycling on the pavement. You know, so what, what's the point of implementing all this money in, in new infrastructures if, if people don't take any notice of it? Yes, I mean, I think that that is right. It's, and that's a very fair point is who would do the sanctioning? Uh, because it's not easy. You know, frankly, the police, uh, they should be doing... Uh, you know, I, I think they should be chasing criminals and preventing crime. Uh, but uh, so they've got their hands full. Uh, traffic wardens were, uh, you know, private security people, um, private uh, parking wardens, that sort of thing. Uh, it's um, it's a pretty sensitive issue. Uh, but but I do you agree with me, Rudy, that uh, whatever you do for one group, the e-scooter group, you should do for for the cyclists and vice versa. Is, is that in itself fair? Well, it's simple. The, the Highway Code already states that that those kinds of vehicles, whether it's a cyclist or not, should not be cycling on pedestrian ways, you know, or, you know, walks. But they continue to do it. The law is already there. It's just a fact that no one is implementing it and no one is taking responsibility to implement it. Well, there we are. Those are Rudy's views. 
uh, calling from Exeter on uh, the, the difficulty of sanctioning uh, e-scooters and indeed cycles. And I think that is a very fair point. Well, now we've got uh, Mike in Wiltshire also calling about e-scooters. Mike, a very good morning to you. Have you used an e-scooter? Uh, what are your I've thoughts on this? One, yes, but uh, not on the public road. Right. And, and what do you I'm think not, about I'm this I'm debate on, on the public... Uh, sorry, go ahead. W what do you think about using them on, on the public road and the trials? What, what, what's your view on them? Well, I actually live in central London, and I really do think they look like a really innovative um, uh, way of solving some of the issues that we, we encounter, which is congestion, too much noise, emissions. So... Uh, properly regulated, I'd be, I'd be in favour of them. What would worry me is if they were dismissed out of hand at this stage, uh, you know, without a proper understanding of how they would work in private use. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on this. I think properly regulated, um, I, I agree. I think Actually, I think they look really quite cool uh, and, and people clearly enjoy using them. Uh, they are quiet. Um, they obviously don't give you the exercise that riding a bike does. Uh, but I, I think, you know, I like the innovation. I love new technology, but it is about regulation. But the previous caller uh, w w was, I think, also rightly concerned. Who's going to sanction? Who's going to impose the sanctions? How do we deal with that, Mike? Well, I would imagine they should be in tandem with electric bikes, um, uh, which are becoming increasingly popular and which I'd also consider. So there should be some kind of regulation that everyone understands. And I think that's the problem at the moment. Nobody quite knows what the regulation is, and the last thing you want is anything complicated. You want something that is clear and understood, and that probably involves no riding on the pavements. Um, and as we see more and more cycle lanes emerge, that would be the perfect place sure. for these to be used. To, you know, and everyone would would be able to do so quite safely. I think that's right, and maybe it's a a a proper, significant financial penalty. Uh, that whether it's imposed by if, if you're using it on a pavement uh, or if you haven't got your number plate it's, um, visible, for example, there's a sanction of of whether it's 50 quid or 75 quid or even 100 quid. That is a material quantity that if you got stopped and you basically were issued a ticket there and then um, that would make you think again. Absolutely. Where, so where, I, where I, would I you pitch the fine, Mike? Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm. I'm, I'm Go on, give, us, give, give, give my listeners well, a, a guess. £50 fines, I suppose, on-the-spot fines, that kind of thing for, for uh, uh, antisocial use. Um, but I, I wasn't thinking about the regulations so much. I was thinking more to do with making them uh, easier for people to use on, on the cycle lanes. Yes, absolutely. And you made a point earlier about um, exercise. I think if somebody has a scooter, they're getting a lot of fresh air, and my understanding is they fold up, and you carry them into the office or you carry them onto a tube train or sure, in, sure. You know, wherever you're going. So you're saying so there's exercise there? I, I, well, I would imagine so. I, as I said, I've only had brief experience of using one, and that was on, on private land. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, I, I, like I had some exercise when I'd used it. What I, what I can tell you, Mike, is that the, the higher bikes, uh, sorry, the higher scooters are actually very heavy. Uh, you're not going to be carrying those. Uh, anywhere, frankly. Uh, Mike from Wiltshire, thank you very much indeed. Well, we've had a big, lively, passionate debate uh, from Ollie Chadwick, who was uh, from Electric Zoom, um, supportive of e-scooters, but regulating them. Sarah Gayton from uh, the Federation for the Blind, passionately against them. Lots of tweets and thoughts. Keep them coming in. Uh, we're going to move on to the next, the second half hour, talking about boosters, uh, vaccines. The time is 11.30. You're listening to Ty's Talk, and this is, of course, Talk Radio. Online and on your smart TV. Talk Radio TV News. With your headlines, I'm Nadira Tudor. Right now, no care in the world. I'm just loving life. A star is born. Britain's Emma Raducanu makes history by winning the US Open. The Health Secretary confirms plans for vaccine passports in England have been axed. And animal rescue workers finally escape Afghanistan. British tennis star Emma Raducanu has made history after winning the US Open last night. She beat her Canadian opponent, Leila Fernandez, in New York, becoming the first British woman to win a Grand Slam in 44 years. It's an absolute dream. Like, you... 
you just have visions of yourself, you know, going up to the box, hugging everyone. I mean, celebrating. Uh, that's something that you you always think of and you always work for. And and for that moment to actually happen, um, yeah, I'm just so grateful for my team that are here with me and the team that are back home and um, the LTA and every every single person who supported me along this journey. Plans to introduce vaccine passports in England have been scrapped. They were set to be made mandatory for entry into nightclubs and other larger events at the end of this month. But earlier, the health secretary, Sajid Javid, confirmed it will no longer happen. I think most people probably instinctively don't like the idea. I mean, I, I've never liked the idea of saying to people, you must show your papers or something to, to do you know, what, what is just an everyday activity. But we were right to, you know, to properly look at it, to look at the evidence. But you're not uh, doing but, it. Well, what I can say is that we've looked at it properly. And whilst we should keep it in reserve as a potential option, I'm pleased to say that we will not be going ahead. And a former Royal Marine who ran an animal shelter in Afghanistan says his staff have made it out of the country safely. Pen Farthing was forced to leave them behind when he managed to fly himself and his cats and dogs out of Kabul last month. He says 68 staff members have now arrived in Pakistan. That's your news on Talk Radio TV. More in half an hour. This is Talk Radio. Across the UK, online, on DAB+, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk. It's 11.33. Well, in the first half of this second hour, things were lively talking about e-scooters. We've had calls, we've had tweets. Keep them coming. I want your views, your thoughts. And I think the next topic will also... Uh, exercise you one way or another. And I want your calls 0344 499 1000 on the issue of booster jabs. To boost or not to boost? That is the next big question. Uh, would you take a booster uh, for you or your family? Uh, and yes or no? If not, why not? Uh, let me know. And I'm delighted uh, to help us in this discussion because I think it's very current and there's, there's a lot going on. Uh, to help us in this discussion, I'm delighted to be joined this morning by Andrew McDonald, who is a vir virologist at the University of Leeds. Andrew, a very good morning. So, uh, good morning. As, as I understand, the latest is that the, the JCVI uh, have not yet ruled on uh, essentially uh, the booster programme, are still thinking about it. Um, presumably their ruling is expected potentially uh, in the next few days or, or, or the next couple of weeks. I, is that right? Yes, yes, that's correct. So we're, they're currently mulling over, I believe, data on the particular nature of the booster that they might well recommend. Um, so they've recently obtained data on this sort of mixed vaccination response. Um, simply put, you know, if I were to go for the booster, I had the AstraZeneca jab, it might be recommended that the booster I get might be Pfizer, for example. So my understanding is that's that's the data that they're currently mulling over. I would really hope that they send government their decision or their um, their recommendation pretty quickly, actually. And 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 just so um, we're clear, do you are they going to rule that? Uh, do you think that all adults should be boosted, or just that the over a certain age group, for example, the over seventies uh, and the vulnerable? Uh, what what's expected in in, uh, in that regard? I would imagine that they will take their usual cautious response and that they will recommend that we provide boosters to the elderly and the clinically vulnerable. And I think the reason behind this is that there's really strong evidence that those groups of people, they don't mount the best resp immune response to either infection or vaccination, and therefore they are really in need of having their immune systems boosted. 
I think when you take the argument wider to you and I, for example, the healthy wider population, I'm not so sure that the evidence is as strong right now to suggest that we should, at this point in time, all be getting a booster. But certainly for the elderly, the immunocompromised, clinically vulnerable, I think that's a bit of a no-brainer. And, and Andrew, just help my listeners a bit more. Uh, is, is the booster essentially a third dose? So is it sort of the same size and strength, so to speak, as the first two? Or is it is it, a, is it, is it just a little boost? Is it, is it smaller? Just, just help us understand exactly what it is. So I, those decisions are yet to be made, and I believe they will also probably come through the recommendations that come to government next week. And again, that will probably depend on the nature of the vaccination boost that they suggest, whether they do go for this mixed vaccination strategy or whether they probably go down the US route where they're continuing with their um, sort of mRNA vaccination approach. They don't, te- they don't tend to touch the AstraZeneca vaccine. They're all the mRNA vaccines. And, and do you know what they're doing in Israel? Because in Israel, as I understand, uh, they've been boosting for some time and, they and they're well through a significant chunk of the population for a so third dose. They are. And actually, they, they were one of the earliest to adopt this third dose approach. Um, and unlike the UK, they've gone for uh, an implementation across the board. So anyone over the age of 12 can get the third dose in Israel. What we have to remember about Israel is that it's quite a different situation to the UK. So they were one of the early front runners in terms of getting the vaccination rollout going. But they went for quite a short time interval between dose number one and dose number two. So which, about of, four weeks. which, of course, was the original recommendation, wasn't it? Uh, we, we was, sort indeed, of... was indeed. We, we were outliers at that particular point in time. And actually, as it turns out, having that delay between your first and second dose actually does have benefits in terms of you mounting a stronger response upon that second dose. So again, I think JCVI will be considering the timing between your second dose and your third dose in terms of whether or not to implement a more wider rollout of this third dose. And and, and this is, you know, another example, Andrew, where in the same way that economists disagree, great scientists disagree. I was I was very interested this week to read in I think it was the Daily Telegraph, uh, a joint article by the chief executive of AstraZeneca, uh, Pascal Soare, and I think it was his chief research scientist, uh, writing that they didn't think that the timing was yet right uh, for boosting. Um, uh, in the, I think they, they, they were saying we needed more data. I think you've just alluded to as well. They wanted more data to come through about the right time to be boosting people. What they didn't want to do was boost people too early and then find that 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 booster might wear off at the yes. coldest time of the year uh sort of january february time so i thought that was fascinating no absolutely and you're you're absolutely right with the fact that so one of the things we have to remember and i think we we forget in this sort of 24 7 news cycle is that viruses are incredibly complicated your immune system is incredibly complicated and we're dealing with a pandemic in real time where, you know, typically, you know, if it's a flu pandemic that comes along, we've got decades worth of flu research to to look back on and make our decisions on. We're having to respond to changes in the virus. We thought we'd got this sorted when we had the Kent, the Alpha variant, and along pops Delta. And we have to change a lot of our preconceptions about how this virus behaves. But the AZ guys are absolutely spot on. We do not want to be giving a third dose at the wrong time for the reason that we won't get the the full benefit of it. And again, I think they allude to the fact that whilst the evidence is really strong for the elderly and the clinically vulnerable, again, for for your average Joe, such as myself, sort of 40-year-old, 30s to 50s, we're still dealing reasonably well with yes. this virus after our second jab. And so I I do not see right now an absolute rush to get that. Now, that may well change, and I may well be on your show in a month's time when new data comes out 
giving you an updated view on that. But I think I really want your listeners to understand that it's not that the scientists don't know what they're talking about. It's not that they're constantly changing their minds. We are adapting as scientists do to an ever evolving landscape of information. And Andrew, you talk about adapting. I wonder whether part of the the wish to delay is because in the same way that flu vaccines get tweaked every year as, as flu uh, you know, tweaks itself, um, yes. do you think they're waiting with the booster and that they might actually tweak the booster to reflect the latest variant, whether it's Delta or, or the next variant that's inevitably, yeah. almost inevitably gonna come along? This is another example where you listen to the companies and you get a slightly different response. So I'm aware that there are newer versions of these vaccines in development. But at the same time, you talk to the Oxford guys who developed the AstraZeneca vaccine, and they're reasonably comfortable that the level of cross protection that you get against variants of concern from the, the original virus that the vaccine was developed against is still pretty robust and that that virus would have to undergo quite a significant change on that spike protein to leave it resistant um, to antibodies. Okay, and and th th that's interesting. And then the other point in the article, and I know it's also that uh, Professor Sarah Gilbert, uh, mm -hmm. who who helped develop the, uh, the AZ vaccine uh, from Oxford, the Oxford scientist, uh, she also is not in favor of boosting <laughs> at this stage. And and part of the, the, their, uh, line of thinking was also that in reality um we should be really whatever vaccines you know are being manufactured and the supply of them we should be using those to give the first dose to people in developing nations who've not yet had that first dose rather than uh giving lots of people in in the developed nations who've already had two doses giving them a third dose and and to be pretty blunt about the language are we being selfish in thinking that we should have a third dose when many people have not had yet yet had their first dose this is this is a really key argument because you know, pandemic global this this is a global situation and we are completely ignoring the fact that there are many countries as you allude to yourself where the, the vaccine take up so far because of supply is hovering around the sort of one percent mark whereas you look at our nation and many other uh, financially um, developed nations we're sort of around the the 70, 80, 90% of the eligible populations having the second jab. Now, that's great for us, but we forget that every time a vir this virus gets inside an unvaccinated host, that is a mixing pot for this virus to try new mutations. And there is any potential, as we saw with Delta, for something to pop out that has an advantage. It may well not be completely resistant, as I mentioned, to vaccine, but it may be something akin to Delta or worse. We have, I believe, an ethical duty to roll this vaccine out more widely. There's also a selfish element to that because it ultimately will ensure increased protection for you and I in the UK to have a more widely vaccinated world population. So she's absolutely right in that sense. I, th I mean, I think this is a, uh, this is a really key point um, and to my listeners, I say, call me with your views and your thoughts on this. 0344 499 1000. I want to get the listeners uh, views on whether whether people should have a third dose here in the UK or whether actually we should be saving every possible vaccine. Given that we've all, all adults have been offered it and had the chance to take it here in the UK, we should now be focusing on getting the uh, the, the, the developing nations, uh, giving them uh, the doses, the vaccines. Um, Andrew, that's absolutely fascinating. And I guess lots of people might feel, Andrew, that, well, uh, you know, I, I've i had my vaccination. I've done what I was asked to do. You know, I've, I've, uh, whether they wanted it or not, you know, we've, we've, we've gone for it. Um, but I, I'm not going to take a booster because, in a sense, uh, either because I had COVID and therefore I've got some natural immunity or because I think that that will give me sufficient protection and maybe maybe I'm almost better off getting a mild dose of it because lots of doctors and scientists say that natural immunity gives you stronger and longer lasting uh, immunity against the virus. What are your thoughts on, on, on that, uh, that thought uh, process? I'll, I'll take the difference in immunity first, if I may, because I think that informs the rest of the answer. I believe the evidence is not really clear that 
natural immunity gives you a different response or a better response to vaccine. One big difference is that if we put a pop, if we put a group of 10 people into a room and we infected them with COVID, each of those 10 people would mount a slightly different level of immune response to that virus. If we instead give 10 people the vaccine, you get a little bit more of a sort of a homogenous, equal response. And so up to about 30% of people who've had this virus don't zero convert. That is, they, they mount an immune response, but it's not a sufficient immune response. And so actually I would still encourage your listeners who may have had COVID and then think, oh, I don't need any vaccination. I would still encourage them actually to take the vaccine because what that gives you is a yes. really strong that, immune response. That, that's understood, Andrew. That's for the vaccine itself. And I guess really the question is whether they'll then uh, take the boost. Andrew, thank you so much for uh, those thoughts. They've been really useful. I think this one is you know, a, a big debating topic and lots of different thoughts. Um, that was Andrew McDonald, virologist at the University of Leeds uh, on the debate about to boost or not to boost um, after the break, give us a call, 0344 499 1000. Would you boost or not boost? This is Ty's Talk on Talk Radio. Online, on DAB, and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
This is Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk. In the middle of what is a spicy, spicy second hour, our debate on e-scooters has got people very fired up indeed. Uh, passionate views, both sides. Interesting tweet that's come in uh, from Mark, who says some scooters can travel between 35 and 40 miles an hour. That sounds lethal. They have dual motors, one on the front and one on the rear. Uh, I would, uh, I would think that sounds totally uh, unacceptable. Lots of passionate thoughts about. Uh, the uh, to boost or not to boost coming in on tweets. I would say strongly people feel that uh, they wouldn't take uh, the booster jab. Uh, and, and I think, in a sense, there are so many questions around that, uh, about whether to boost, who should be boosted, when to boost, uh, what's the benefit. And uh, so I think that one, uh, there's, there's, there's a huge amount of information, a uh, huge amount of debate, and when you've got experts like the chief executive of one of the vaccine manufacturers himself saying that we shouldn't be boosting yet and the designer of the vaccine, um, uh, I think it's going to be very interesting. Interesting to see what the JCVI say. Anyway, uh, we've got a couple of callers on this. Steve in Liverpool. Good morning. It is still just good morning. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, on vaccines? Hi, Richard. Um, well, the vaccines, you know, I was, I was calling up about the vaccines for kids. Now, they've done this in other countries like Israel, and, you know, it's had no effect to how the virus spreads. So, you know, I think parents need to look at it a case of, um, at best, it's just a, a garbage idea vaccinating kids at well, worst. I mean, the, 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 yeah, to be clear, Steve, uh, the whole the, the, the JCVI has made a They've, they've made a recommendation so far not to vaccinate children. Different countries have, of course, made different decisions uh, about vaccinating them. And, it, and in a sense, the data is coming through all the time. So um, yeah. I, I think, you know, we have to uh, be clear that, um, and in fairness to the JCVI, uh, uh, that's exactly what they said. They said they're looking at the data. Um, and whilst they, they felt that there was a marginal benefit, what concerned yeah. them was was because the, of the data coming through and they use these words what they didn't know was the magnitude of the potential harms for vaccinating children that's that's the issue but they're still looking at it but other nations have made different decisions um steve Definitely. thank you very much are you a reds or are you a blues fan steve uh, i'm i'm an i'm an air red can i just make one more point later before i go uh, go for it on on okay. uh, on that I'm, or on, on really, the uh, on the no, booster no, tell no, me what's your view on the booster that's... steve no, no, definitely not. But what I'm concerned about, if these, you know, I think Boris Johnson is going to keep this going as an emergency because he does not have to deal with the country. I don't think this is going to end until he resigns. Well, uh, that's that, that's an interesting viewpoint. Um, Steve, he is certainly a uh, an authoritarian prime minister who doesn't seem to like votes and debates in the House of Commons where he might be challenged. Um, thank you for that, Steve. Uh, Marcus in Stirling. Uh, wants to tell me about uh, boosters. Marcus, good morning. Good morning, Richard. Um, all we have to do is look at the data available. 99.7% of people in this country will not be affected or not be seriously at risk of death from this virus. Now, when we look at the cases in Israel of myocarditis, currently six in every thousand under 25-year-olds, particularly male, are suffering from this right now. We have no long-term information, not just for that group, which the, the GCVI have pumped the brakes on, but we have no information long-term on any of us. Two years is a normal period that you would want to have in testing, normally testing of animals. Now, we just do not have this information. But for me, I'm telling all the people I know not to take this booster. And, and, uh, and Marcus, just to be just to be clear, Marcus, are you are you are you a scientist or are you a doctor or are you a medic or are you uh, just a layman a who's read thinker. up on this? I'm a critical thinker. A critical thinker. I'm okay. Someone that can look at both sides of the argument, like Brexit. I won't be bullied into thinking the, the BBC line, yeah, sure, or the civil service line. Obviously, obviously, um, what 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 we, we we do, Marcus, because we're uh, you know a regulated broadcaster. Um, uh, we have to be very clear about uh, you know we can't give people advice because you and I are not scientists. No, 
Uh, I'm telling and... you what I'm. I'm telling. I'm. I'm all, all. I'm doing is giving you an account that you've asked for. Yes. Of what people are doing in yep. relation to the booster. This now is... I am. I'm getting as many people as I can to look at the same information as me. They can decide for themselves because it's all about informed consent. The government do not have my consent and will never have my consent when they continually. Let's not call it a lie. Let's just say that they've been a little bit liberal with the truth to keep Ofcom happy, sir. So if people look at both sets of information, and if they look at Matt Hancock, Neil Ferguson, the BBC, will I take their advice, or will I look at other virologists, epidemiologists, experts in their field? I think what they're actually doing now, Richard, is they're getting very nervous about the long-term damage that's going to be done to everybody. Well, in a sense... That in a sense, what's, what's happening is they're looking at the data, Marcus, and uh, they're having to make different judgments. And certainly that's what the JCVI uh, are doing in respect of uh, vaccinating children. I think it's clear that the JCVI are looking, JCVI are looking very carefully at the data for boosters. Um, and, and who knows what that decision will be. But we can see what, uh, what the chief of AstraZeneca says. Thanks for that, Marcus. Uh, we're approaching the top of the hour. It's 11.57. You're listening to Ty's Talk. On Talk Radio. Online, on DAB, and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. Online and on your smart TV. Talk Radio TV News. Live at midday, I'm Nadira Tudor. Right now, no care in the world, I'm just loving life. The Queen leads praise for Britain's Emma Raducanu after she makes history at the US Open. Covid passport U turn as the Health Secretary confirms they won't be introduced in England. And animal rescue workers finally escape Afghanistan. British tennis star Emma Raducanu has made history after winning the US Open last night. She beat Canadian Leila Fernandez in New York without dropping a set, becoming the first British woman to win a Grand Slam in 44 years. The 18-year-old from South London, who only did her A-levels a few months ago, is also the first qualifier ever to win a major tournament. I'm not even thinking about, like, 
when I'm going home. I have no idea when I'm going home. I've got no idea what I'm doing tomorrow. Uh, I'm just really trying to embrace the moment and um, really take it all in. And I think it's definitely the time to just switch off uh, from from any future thoughts or from any plans, uh, any schedule. I've got absolutely no clue. And uh, right now, no care in the world. I'm just loving life. <laughs> Well, the Queen was among those to congratulate Emma on her performance, saying in a statement, it is a remarkable achievement at such a young age and is testament to your hard work and dedication. The Prime Minister also tweeted, saying you showed extraordinary skill, poison guts, and we're all hugely proud of you. And... <laughs> this was the scene at her local tennis club in Beckenham, where she has played since she was six, just after she clinched the title. In other news, the government scrapped plans for COVID vaccine passports in England. They were set to be mandatory for entry into nightclubs and other huge, uh, large venues at the end of this month. But earlier, the Health Secretary Sajid Javid confirmed the scheme will no longer be introduced, saying we shouldn't be doing things for the sake of it. I think most people are probably instinctively don't like the idea. I mean, I, I've never liked the idea of saying to people, you must show your papers or something to, to do you know, what, what is just an everyday activity. But we were right to, you know, to properly look at it, to look at the evidence. But you're not uh, doing but, it. Well, what I can say is that we've looked at it properly. And whilst we should keep it in reserve as a potential option, I'm pleased to say that we will not be going ahead and a former Royal Marine who ran an animal shelter in Afghanistan says his staff have made it out of the country safely. Pen Farthing was forced to leave them behind when he managed to fly himself and his cats and dogs out of Kabul last month. He says 68 staff and family members have now arrived in Pakistan and he's so happy. And your weather, dry and bright for most with some sunshines at times. Cloudy in the southwest with rain spreading northeast and affecting western areas throughout the afternoon. Highs of 21 degrees. That's your live news on Talk Radio T. TV more in half an hour. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. is Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB+, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk, and it is good afternoon. It's 12.03 on Talk Radio. Well, certainly we've got lots of reactions to the debate and the discussion I had with Andrew McDonald, the virologist from Leeds University, about boosters. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, Andrew's triggered all sorts of uh, views. Um, uh, Lynn from Cardiff said she would certainly think twice before having a booster, her and her husband. Uh, someone else accuses me. Uh, John says that, uh, uh, that I've really sold out on jabs, aren't I? Well, yes, I've had my double jab. I'm 56. I have serious questions about, uh, like the JCVI, about the benefits or otherwise of vaccinating uh, children. Never before have uh, adults asked children to protect the adults. Uh, so, you know, I'm very clear uh, that, uh, I mean, my children are older than that, but if my children were 12 to 15, um, I would be, be having a very, very serious think about that. What I'm actually really sold out on, though, to be clear, is I think we should be having more and more focus on treatments. As we learn to live with this virus, and whatever it does, however it varies from here on, we need to understand more and have greater confidence in the benefits of the treatments. I talked about it a couple of weeks ago. I'll come back to it because I think that's one of the ways that we get confidence to live with this virus is the treatments as science continues to evolve them. There's a new one, Ronaprieve, uh, was, uh, was approved just the other day and there are more being tested by the Oxford Principal Trials uh, you know, potential drugs like ivermectin, controversial, approved in some countries, not approved here in the UK or the US, but being trialled. So I think that the story will evolve there uh, in terms of treatments. Anyway, we're going to move on in the third hour. We need to talk about uh, supply chains, food shortages, and whether or not, uh, you know, some of you, and I want to hear your views on this. Have you seen uh, empty or half empty 
uh, shelves in your supermarkets, in your shops uh, recently? Can you get the deliveries you want, you want or are you being frustrated? Uh, and are these, uh, are these shortages, are they, are they nationwide? Are they just in certain areas? Just in certain types of super, you know, certain uh, supermarkets? Uh, and whether or not these shortages, uh, whether or not they're going to be temporary or whether they're going to be permanent. Well, I'm delighted now to be joined by Ian Wright, the chief executive of the Food and Drink Federation, to talk about this. Uh, he knows what his members uh, are experiencing. Ian, a very good afternoon to you. Uh, so tell us your your views about the uh, the latest experiences that your members are having uh, with uh, supply chains uh, here in the UK and, and, you know, the supply of goods from elsewhere in the world. Because, you know, we do hear that actually these issues are not just confined to the UK, but they, in fact, uh, they're everywhere. I'm hearing of, of shortages in, in continental Europe, uh, as well as in the US. Uh, so so w what's your understanding? What are your members telling you about the latest that's going on? Well, Richard, it's very nice to be with you. Thank you for having me. Um, I think the, thing, the first thing to say before I say anything else is we are not going to run out of food. Excellent. Red That's a great start. Underlined just to be very clear. Um, but what is happening now, and I think these changes are structural. Uh, they are to some degree uh, post-Brexit changes, but they have much more to do with the government's immigration policy than they did have to do with Brexit. And they are very definitely post-COVID. Uh, there are a number of driving factors here, but what, what has actually happened is that across the farm to fork food chain, which employs 4 million people from farmers through manufacturers and importers, through restaurants, bars, hospitality, contract catering, supermarkets, logistics, and packaging, because 70% of packaging is for food. Across that whole chain, about one in eight workers have gone missing since uh, the start of this year, or rather since March the 17th last year when we locked down. Now, some of those people who've gone missing are European workers who've gone home, but many of them are people who post-COVID have decided to change their lifestyles and do what the Bank of England calls becoming economically inactive. We've also seen major changes as people move from traditional roles into online retailing of all sorts. And the consequences of all of that are that our just-in-time supply chain, which we've had for 40 years and which has meant that uh, food rocks up on the shelves of supermarkets and in the kitchens of restaurants so that it's always there when we need it, it's always available, gives us the widest possible choice in almost every location and at all price points. That system is being very fast eroded and it's my contention, though it's not necessarily the view of everybody else, that we are not going to see the ability to sustain that uh, in the future. As I say, it doesn't mean we're going to run out of food. It just means there'll be fewer choices. And sometimes things like last week in the east of England, where bottled water was not available uh, in many, many places, sometimes manufacturers or distributors will have to prioritise. And that means some products won't be there. And, and, and that's a, so this is a really key thing, isn't it? I, you know, the reality is we have had uh, just in time delivery and and you know the logistics chains are just extraordinarily clever at being able to uh, to achieve that just in time it makes firms more profitable and things but maybe actually um, Ian we've just been too demanding in in the last decade or so we've expected to get all types of vegetables uh, available throughout the whole of the year and everything else and in a sense um, we've we've be, we've become too too complacent about that um, rather than recognizing that uh, you know maybe you shouldn't expect every single type of every product to be available on every every uh, supermarket shelf at all times of the year is that a sort of expectation management uh, process yeah i think well, i think that's actually exactly what i'm trying to do i'm trying to manage people's expectations of what the system can provide in the future now, I believe that choice is the heart of democracy. The more choice you get, the more democratic you are, and certainly the more satisfied our shoppers and our diners are. And they've become used to that, that very wide variety of choice at all price points, as I say. What I think we're beginning to see is the erosion of the choice. That's to say, there won't be as many choices of individual products available, but sometimes the product 
sometimes that will be driven uh, by geography as well. And I think one of the things that would most concern me about this is that those places that are geographically most remote, and in particular those remote places which are economically most disadvantaged, may be the ones that, for all sorts of understandable market reasons, are the ones that aren't prioritised and therefore have the, the least choice. And that is something that I think should concern all of us. Uh, that's that's very interesting. Um, so, uh, Ian, just help me a bit more on, I mean, as we learn this process, do you think that uh, firms, uh, the logistics firms, the supermarkets, that, that they will, in a sense, tweak and adjust their supply chains, uh, the, the way that they organise their lorries and things, to get a bit more sophisticated, to respond to these these changing situations, these changing circumstances? Yes, I think they will. But obviously, the, the, the real problem comes when you've got five lorries to send to a particular place over a 24 hour period, and you've only got enough drivers to do three, three visits. And that's where you have to prioritise. Now, we've heard a lot about lorry drivers being in short supply, and that is certainly true. I'm not entirely sure that the British public is desperately keen to see for example, lorry driver tests accelerated to the point where where we need safety as well. And of course, there's a, a trade off here, not just amongst lorry drivers, but in almost all jobs, you can get people into jobs, but a lot of them are very skilled roles. They may not be, they may be at all different levels of pay, but they'll have all sorts of skills required. And we need the people with the skills to do the jobs. And it will be that trade off that manufacturers and logistics firms, as you say, have to make over the next few months. And some of this will get better as we get more use to this uh, to this lack of, of one in eight uh, workers. But some of it will have to take a, a lot longer. And one of the things that will work over the longer term is automation. There are a lot of roles that can be automated. I'm not sure, I mean, we can certainly automate factories with more robots. We can probably automate um, those places where there are uh, opportunities to use machines, abattoirs may be automatable, if that's a word. Um, but we may also be able in time to see the role for driverless uh, vehicles and drones to deliver stuff. But we're not there yet. And I think it's this adjustment period as the market and manufacturers and logistics firms and retailers and restaurants get used to this, that will be the period that's extremely bumpy. Indeed, and we had a debate on this show uh, last week uh, about uh, the lorry driver shortages, and we had a number of actual lorry drivers call in. And I think you know the reality is, uh, and I would put it that that you know some of the big logistics firms, uh, the big supermarkets, they in a sense they had the negotiating leverage for many years, and that for example, lorry drivers' wages fell behind market rates and the facilities, and it's a tough job, and it's actually a very responsible job. Uh, driving a huge Arctic down a motorway. You know, you have got to have your wits absolutely about you at all times. And what I've been learning is that the the pay rates uh, and the attraction of the job relative to other jobs with the same or more pay um, is one of the key reasons. And in a sense, the negotiating leverage has moved in favour of, uh, of the lorry drivers. But I guess you've just touched on the point there, Ian, which is that and I always say, you know, if you can't get the labour, you've got two choices. You've either got to pay more for the labour or you've got to invest in, in capital equipment. That's uh, to replace the labour. That's sort of the, the most basic sort of economics. Um, and I think you've just alluded to that. But I guess it's a long time before we'll be having driverless lorries. Um, so it sounds like really businesses have got to adapt. They've got to adjust. And, but I've got great confidence, Ian, that businesses will do that very smart because, you know, so many of these logistics firms are so clever at what they do. Yeah, I agree with that. But I think the adjustment period is going to take quite a long time. And it isn't just in logistics. That's the key thing. The, 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 the absence of workers is across the supply chain. So from our point of view, we know there are difficulties. And I think they're in the papers this morning about picking in the fields at the moment. There are a lot of people who have to do kind of post harvest packing jobs. There are roles, as I said, in abattoirs that are, that are now unfilled. There are roles, as anybody who's been on holiday anywhere in this country this, this summer will know, there are lots and lots of uh, restaurants, bars, hotels, finding it very difficult to staff up. And it's those as well that will, will meet, make the difference 
to the way people perceive the availability of food. But as I keep saying, and I think it's really important to say, we're not going to run out of food, we're not going to run out of drink, but we may see random shortages. And the other effect, uh, which you just, I think, kind of almost introduced, is that there is a choice. You're dead right. There's a choice between investment in capital equipment or paying people more. Either way, that means costs go up and prices will rise. Now, I think you know I've spent a long time over the last few years saying that, in a, in a way, food is too cheap in this country or it is unsustainably cheap. We only spend about 7% of our household income on food in the 1950s, that number was way over 40%. Now, nobody wants to go back to the absence sure, sure. of choice of the 1950s. But what we do have to expect, I think, is price rises in food over the next few months. I think we'll see food price inflation up around 6 7 8%. That doesn't mean overall inflation will go up because there are other factors going in the other direction. Indeed, in, that, that, that's absolutely right. That's really helpful. And there's no question there is a bit of food inflation. There is wage inflation in the system. But I think maybe yeah. if food got too cheap, or not too cheap, but became much, much cheaper, I wonder whether that was linked to uh, people not being, you know, being a bit more wasteful with food. Um, uh, anyway, Ian, we're going to have to leave it there. But thank you so much for your thoughts uh, on this Sunday afternoon really interesting about the challenges of the supply chain industry all the way from food from the fields to the fork. That was Ian Wright, Chief Executive of the Food and Drink Federation. Thank you for that. Well, the time is 12.17. We're rattling through the third hour, but I want your thoughts, your calls uh, on anything we've been talking about today. E-scooters, boosters, uh, Cressida Dick. Give us a call, send us a tweet or a text. You're listening to Ty's Talk here on Talk Radio. Online, on DAB, and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
This is Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk here at the home of Common Sense Talk Radio. It's 12.22. Well, we were just talking uh, earlier in this hour to Ian Wright of the Food and Drink Federation about the supply chain challenges and issues. My view is that uh, without question, uh, firms will adapt. Uh, they, you know, they're so innovative. Uh, they will change their uh, delivery routines. They'll, they may change the size of the lorries, how much they fill them up. Um, but I really think it's absolutely vital that uh, lorry drivers, people in the logistics chain, uh, are paid uh, a proper rate to attract people into the industry. I think they, you know, the big business has had it too good for too long uh, and that they haven't uh, kept wages, uh, haven't kept pace really with, uh, with inflation or be, be beyond. But I'd be really interested in your views, your thoughts on anything that we've been talking about this morning, whether it's lorry driver wages or uh, in the first hour, of course, we were talking about Cressida Dick uh, and whether or not you thought she's brilliant, should stay or should have gone uh, or whether you didn't uh, rate her. So give us a call 0344 499 1000. Text us to talk 8722 or tweet us at talk radio and lots of tweets coming in. Uh, Catherine very kindly says, just wanted to say uh, that this show, like many other talk radio shows, is up there as unmissable. Thank you very much, Catherine. And Malcolm says uh, that's another vote in the general election. So um, some things are looking up. But lots and lots of tweets about and my first question to you, which was whether or not uh, you trust this government. And I have to say that well, well over 90% of the tweets were basically saying that there was a loss of trust in uh, in the government and we really did see it didn't we today this morning i mean i just I, I really can't get over the fact that the health secretary i mean i'm delighted absolutely delighted that the health secretary has said uh, they're not going to roll out vaccine passports but that's this morning that's this sunday this is the same bloke who in the middle of last week uh, came on to julia hartley brewer's show and said that vaccine passports were an essential part of uh, the battle, uh, the defence against COVID. So if he can change his mind on something so fundamental, so principled in a matter of days, who's to say where we will be this time next week? Um, I think it's really challenging. We, we all grew up, uh, in a sense, learning to trust the government, to trust the police. This is sort of two absolute foundations of of the United Kingdom, of our of our sense of fair play, of our sense of trust and respect in those who lead us and govern us and how well our country is managed. But if we lose that trust, then I think everything does start to really break down uh, and get challenged. And that, that really concerns me. Likewise, the leadership of the Met Police is so important to the 8 million people or so living here in London. And I've got Dave in the Wirral, uh, I think is on the line to, with some thoughts on the Met Police Commissioner, Cressida Dick. Dave, uh, good afternoon. Good, good afternoon, Richard, and, and it's great to speak to you. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I, I, I do ring in occasionally, usually when I get it wound up, and I, I thought I'd get wound up today. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it was just briefly about um, Cressida Dick. Are you a supporter, Ooh, Dave? I, um, funnily enough, Richard, no. Um, I used to be because I, I was a police officer for, for, for many, 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 many years. And I did briefly work with Cresta Dick uh, at Brams Hill, which is the staff college that used to be in uh, Hampshire. And a very, very intelligent woman. I mean, seriously, on paper, very, very bright, very, very good at what she did. But unfortunately, Richard, she's one of those people who you'd probably have as your number two. She right. definitely hasn't got the leadership skills to be the number one of the most important force in the country. And the interesting thing was that she'd actually retired from the police for about two years before she became the commissioner. And she would got a, a secondment with the, the Foreign Office. And she was doing some work there. I'm sure it was very august and very excellent. But she was called upon at the time to apply to become the commissioner because I don't know if you know, the commissioner and deputy commissioner are not officially police officers. 
they're actually home office appointments and you could theoretically be an ex-army officer and be the commissioner of the metropolis and so she came along and it was quite obvious she'd been chosen because she had certain qualities that they were looking for not necessarily leadership qualities if, if i'm being diplomatic enough um and as a result because she is truly obsessed with wokeism uh, before wokeism was even a, a trend um she has proved herself to be exactly what the police don't need uh, um, no one's looking for an aggressive police force but what we do need is to carry all parts of the community with us and at the moment it's very much if you have white skin you're of no relevance i, I think david the, you know, there is there is no question that um and i think we've seen this really significantly in the last 12 months the lack of consistency in yeah. policing for example different protests in london uh you know, has been really significant and I think has upset a lot of people. And for me, that's about the quality of the management giving the right brief to um, officers on the front line, uh, you know, who've got to carry out that brief. And they, 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 need the right, uh, they need the right guidance, the right framework, the right instruction. So how many years were you were you in the Met? Uh, uh, I, I, no, I, actually, I wasn't in the Met. Um, Brams Hill would take off senior officers from all parts of the country to, right. to train the leaders. But the interesting thing, and just touching on what you talked about, Richard, quite rightly, is very much around the leadership. So a chief constable is a very powerful person, just like the commissioner is a powerful person in the Met. And what would happen was the chief constable would call you in and say, I've got a thought around what we should be doing set up an inquiry and this is what i want the outcome to be and that's very much how the police work and so everyone then configures their outcome to fit in with what the chief constable gave them as a heads up now the same thing happens with the commissioner and you're spot on when you talk about the outcome from the, the front line you know the, the sergeants the constables on the front line they probably disagree vehemently with what is happening but unfortunately they also know they want to keep their jobs. They want to keep their pensions. And so certain um, protests, should we say, were treated far more aggressively and assertively by the police than others. And that literally comes from the top. It doesn't come from the bottom. It, that's not how the police works, Richard. It's very much what would the commissioner think? And that means the police officers on the ground now determine the way that, to me, if you've committed a crime, you get arrested. Doesn't matter what colour of skin you are, what race, religion for sure, you have for committed sure. the crime. I'm, I'm really focused. I'm, uh, I'm really focused on this point about the quality of leadership uh, yeah. and, and consistent policing. And look, I, you know, I've run businesses. You know, ultimately, the boss wants uh, you know to, to, to organise uh, the team uh, to carry out, the, in a sense, um, you know, to achieve the aims of of the business yeah. or in this case of the force but but you know it's very different when it's a public service and it's policing but it's, in summary to finish david is the quality of leadership in the met uh, good enough uh, given the scale of the responsibilities um pro probably not and and as most police officers who are probably listening to you today who live who live in the provinces and have worked in the provinces outside london Live, uh, sorry, Lon London has always been this way, Richard. It's always been more politics than policing. And the trouble is, those people who are employed as commissioners, probably Bernard Hogan Howe might have been, maybe not in this category, but those people who try to police the metropolis, as in fighting crime, yeah. they don't tend to last very long. It and they know well, that. Well, um, David, thank you very much for that. As far as I'm concerned, uh, Londoners want policing, not politics, in the Met Police. Uh, that was David from the Wirral, a former police officer, with his thoughts. Uh, thank you very much for that, David. It's 12, just after 12.30. You're listening to Ty's Talk. It's Talk Radio. Online and on your smart TV. Talk Radio TV News. With your headlines, I'm Nadira Tudor. Right now, no care in the world. I'm just loving life. A star is born. Britain's Emma Raducanu makes history by winning the US Open. And the health secretary confirms plans for vaccine passports in England have been axed. 
British tennis star Emma Raducanu has made history after winning the US Open last night. She beat her Canadian opponent, Leila Fernandez, in New York, becoming the first British woman to win a Grand Slam in 44 years. I'm not even thinking about, like, when I'm going home. I have no idea when I'm going home. I've got no idea what I'm doing tomorrow. Uh, I'm just really trying to embrace the moment and um, really take it all in. And I think it's definitely the time to just switch off uh, from from any future thoughts or from any plans, uh, any schedule. I've got absolutely no clue. And uh, right now, no care in the world. I'm just loving life. <laughs> Plans to introduce vaccine passports in England have been scrapped. They were set to be made mandatory for nightclubs and other large events at the end of this month. But the health secretary has confirmed it will no longer happen. I think most people are probably instinctively don't like the idea. I mean, I, I've never liked the idea of saying to people, you must show your papers or something to, to do you know, what, what is just an everyday activity. But we were right to, you know, to properly look at it, to look at the evidence. But you're not uh, doing but, it. Well, what I can say is that we've looked at it properly. And whilst we should keep it in reserve as a potential option, I'm pleased to say that we will not be going ahead. And a former Royal Marine who ran an animal shelter in Afghanistan says his staff have made it out of the country safely. Pen Farthing was forced to leave them behind when he managed to fly in his cats and dogs out of Kabul last month. He says 68 staff members have now arrived in Pakistan. That's your news on Talk Radio TV. More in half an hour. This is Talk Radio. Across the UK, online, on DAB+, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk. I can't believe it has flown by. We're into the last half hour of a three-hour show. It's been spicy. It's been punchy. Uh, we've been talking about whether or not to keep Cressida Dick or whether she should have been asked to pack her bags. We were talking about the big debate, e-scooters or not. And the results so far on the Twitter poll we've been running, almost a 1,000 votes. Uh, the questions asked was to ban e-scooters. 51% said yes, ban them. Keep them was about 11%. Uh, and about 38% said keep them but regulate them. In other words, learn the lessons from the trials. That's where I'm at. Well, I'm delighted now uh, that we're going to go on to talk about the uh just i just i think we've got our yeah, we're going to go to sorry uh the the uh the call we've got christine in gloucestershire christine good afternoon to you uh so what are your afternoon. thoughts well i think that part of the problem for the labor shortages in this country is because ever since that we had people coming to work here from abroad the wages have been held very low and whereas Certain people from coming from Eastern Europe, for example, would share a house, say six of them, to come and work here for a couple of years to build up, you know, a good income for themselves to go home with. Uh, but it's not enough to pay a British person rent or more, and certainly no more, not mortgages, in this country. So in the hospitality industry, for example, they, the people came here, they worked very hard, they were great workers. But they could afford to share a house, say, six of them at a time. And I had spoken to lots of them while they were here, you know, part, sort of people who go and clean people's houses. And they said, oh, yes, uh, well, I'm just here for a couple of years because uh, I can earn better wages here than I did in Bulgaria. And uh, I go home when I have my couple of weeks off. But I share a house with six other people and we share the rent. And it's usually, you know in a very modest uh, type of accommodation. But if you're a working person in this country who has a family, you've got a mortgage to pay or rent to, say, £500 a month in, well, that's quite, you know, average in Britain, there's no way that you can live on the wages that are being well, paid. And in a, sense, in a sense, Christine, I mean, I was arguing this throughout the Brexit debate, that one, one of the issues 
that people up and down the country realised was that if you have an unlimited supply of uh, of labour, um, uh, relatively lower skilled labour, then yeah. you're going to keep downward pressure on uh, on the wages. It's basic economics, and exactly right. Uh, and 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 that is essentially what's happened. And yes. the evidence is clear uh, that I was right, and that many people who voted Brexit were right because now. Uh, the, the rules of the game have changed. Uh, all of a sudden, there's a bit of a shortage. And guess what? The good news is wages have increased for some of those lower paid, including people in really responsible, critical positions like uh, lorry drivers. Christine, thank you very much for that. And um, we're going to move uh, now to just to talk about the, uh, the anniversary, the 20th anniversary uh, yesterday and the commemorations that were held uh, across the world, but of course, in particular, in the United States, um, across the US, uh, but powerfully in, in New York, in Washington, uh, and in Sh uh, Shanksville, where uh, that plane crashed into a field because the brave passengers uh, took on the hijackers. And I'm delighted now to be joined by Greg Swenson, chairman of Republican Overseas, uh, who, was, who was right by, as I understand, Greg, uh, right by the North Tower, uh, when it was hit. So, um, Greg, tell us about uh, your emotions and your feelings yesterday. I mean, every day must, must be there, but the anniversaries must be really challenging for you. Yeah, Richard, uh, first of all, great to be here. Um, I, I'm not sure that they're challenging. I mean, I look back at it as, you know, maybe the worst day of my life, but in many ways, best day of my life. You know, you go through, I think there was a lot of, you know, everybody was really nervous, including me when it happened but you know i think what was more important was you know keeping a, some perspective because it was a really bad day for a lot of people and a lot of families but um also a day of of great heroism and and i had someone with me um at i was at uh, working at lehman brothers um that day i was in new york i didn't live in new york at the time i lived in chicago but i was visiting for a meeting and i had a client who i'd never met meet me there and so i was you know, I, I was more worried about her and we've, you know, we're, we're now great friends. So on, on, on the anniversaries, especially the big one like yesterday, I talked to everybody that I was with that day and everyone is, you know, all, all of the people that were important f figures in that day for me, that helped me that day, that helped other people. You know, those are, are my you know greatest friends in life. Sure, sure. And, and certainly, I mean, I, the, I find these anniversaries and the, and the ceremonies very, very moving. Uh, the reading of the names by by relatives, mm -hmm. uh, who, those who lost their lives, the carrying of the photos. Um, I, I, I've been to New York to the uh, to the site. Um, I mean, I do think the memorial is for me, and it's obviously a personal thing. I find it utterly beautiful and moving. It's phenomenal, um, yeah. And, and and any any listeners, you know, if you're at home, if you ever get the chance to go to New York, do make sure you go to that memorial. Uh, it, it is quite extraordinary. Um, but if we look forward, uh, in a sense. You know, it changed the world. Most of us had never heard of Al Qaeda, um, and it, just under three thousand people died on the day. But if we if we sort of look forward now, Greg, to in a sense the consequences of that, because everything did change, and we, we've got the issue where the decisions made by the political leaders at the time, uh, in terms of going into Afghanistan and then going into Iraq and all the, the consequences of that, you know, I just looked at the numbers uh, yesterday. Um, since then, uh, you know, over 10,000 allied troops and contractors have died. Uh, in America, the, the stats, uh, you might help me with the right, give or take some 30,000 veterans, um, they think may have committed suicide. Over 300,000 civilians may have been killed in, in, in the wars afterwards. I mean, there's extraordinary lessons about the consequences of these big political decisions. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point, Richard. And, and look, you know, war is terrible. And, and, you know, Ronald Reagan was famous about that. You know, he, he knew how terrible war was. And, and the best way to avoid it is to just maintain strength, you know, basically strength through peace. And so, yeah, I think mistakes were made at the time, as you, you know, as we all recall, at the time, it was sort of a no brainer to go into Afghanistan and get rid of Al Qaeda and get rid of anybody that was supporting Al Qaeda. So, 
you know that it, but then i guess you know we, we had mission creep and all of a sudden we're, we're nation building so yeah in in retrospect there were surely mistakes made the costs seemed to be great but on the other hand fighting the fight over there was better than having terrorist attacks in the u.s and if and you'll notice you know there hasn't really been a major terrorist event in the u.s all the ones that have happened like the boston marathon bombing we're all lone wolf, you know, sort of homegrown terrorists. It was never organized. So. And, and, and that, Greg, certainly um, a line of argument that I use here in the UK when people say, you know, why were we in Afghanistan for so long? Well, in a sense, uh, it was to prevent terror groups from training and organizing uh, right. in Afghanistan. And you know, for my own view, uh, I, I feel that it was the wrong thing to do to pull out. I, you know, I think uh, we could have had a very small uh, NATO force, maybe maintained Agreed. around Bagram Air Base and things. Um, yeah. but, but I think the, uh, you know, there are real, you touched on, you've got to have the right clear objectives uh, and, a, and a real strategy to achieve that objective and then have an exit strategy. And, uh, you know, I just think that's one of the big lessons. But tell me, um, what's the mood in, uh, in the US about Afghanistan? Uh, in, in a sense, to all of us, I think it feels like a defeat. How does this compare to Vietnam? When the history books are written, you know, for our children in, in 20, 30 years time, w will people feel that Afghanistan was, was as big a defeat as, as Vietnam or, or is it different? I, I mean, look, there, it's sort of apples and oranges, but I would argue it, it was worse. You know, what happened in Vietnam was a slow burn. You know, we, we, the U.S. essentially won that war or could have won that war. They, the, the, the VC, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese never actually won a major battle in Vietnam. But the, but you had you, you had this political change in the U.S. and, and people were watching the war on their on their TV sets. So the, it was the political support that disappeared in Vietnam. And, and remember, we the Paris Peace Treaty was signed in 73. We didn't actually lose the embassy till 75. And that's when the, a lot of the, Joe Biden and, and his fellow Democrats denied Gerald Ford the ability to fund and support the South Vietnamese. In this case, in Afghanistan, it, this was totally avoidable. I mean, you, you brought up a good point, Richard, a small force. We had 2,500 troops there. The Afghanistan committee, bipartisan, had a lot of Obama people on it, recommended to Biden, to President Biden, that he maintain 4,500 troops. There were 2,500 at the time. And remember, there were 7,000 plus NATO troops at the time. You know, this is only two months ago. And so that was avoidable. We, we didn't have to lose this war. It was a total own goal by, 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 by President Biden. And we could have maintained, you know, this I mean, we, just like we have for the last 18 months from when, um, when they signed the, the agreement in February of 2020, there hasn't been an American fatality. And, and we had air, air support and intelligence support without active boots on the ground. It was re working well and, and Biden and, completely um crushed himself. And in terms of uh, the mood, uh, I mean, do you think that that uh, that pullout and of course, in a sense, he wanted to pull out ahead of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Yeah. But mm -hmm. actually, is that going to work against the Democrats uh, in the midterms and then the, the next presidential election? Because people feel that it was such a humiliating, embarrassing, yeah. self-inflicted own goal? Or will, will people focus on other issues? Uh, a little bit of both. I mean, this was the most visible one. And this was one that that was that reached the global audience because it affected the UK. It, it, he ignored, you know, Prime Minister Johnson for 36 hours. He didn't listen to his. He didn't talk to his allies. He didn't tell them he was closing Bagram Air Base. I mean, he made so many mistakes. And this was a self. You're right. It's a total self-inflicted wound. And it, it will hurt the Democrats. Now, this is on top of the complete self-inflicted wound at the border, the southern border, uh, the wreckage to the economy, the problems with COVID right now, which I don't blame on Biden, but he's sure, it, it's surely being blamed on him, even though I don't think that's fair. Uh, so so he's, done, he's done a lot of damage to the U.S. in his short seven or eight months. But this was the first time where it was a global event, a global disaster, as opposed to just a domestic disaster. And, and, so and it, Greg, will, it will last. And Greg, you know, we... I've always grown up, uh, most of us have really, that the US is the global sort of super policeman and that, that mm -hmm. we could trust the US to be essentially the, uh, the backer of last resort for NATO operations and logistics and air cover. And I think what I worry now is that that trust 
uh, has has been damaged and, and potentially gone. And that that's a wholesale change in the world order. Um, what's your views on that? Am I am I wrong or right on that? Uh, again, sorry to be so indecisive, but but both. Um, you're you're right that is it is a threat to the relationships with the allies. It's it's proven weakness on on the on the part of President Biden. Uh, however, I, I I'm an optimist, and you know the midterms are only 14 months away. Unfortunately, the presidential election is three and a half years away. So think we will we'll, we will be back. The Republicans will be back. Patriotism will be back, and and peace through strength will be back. But right now, this is the other the other problem that, you know, as I said, Afghanistan debacle was was a self-inflicted wound, but also very visible to the world. What's not so visible is the defense cuts in Biden's budget. That is not a good sign with at least with Trump. You had well, military build up peace through strength. That's what our allies want. Sure. And that's what America should do. And, and well, Greg, that's fantastic. What I mean, what we need is, you know, is strong, clear leadership. And at the moment, uh, with Biden, we haven't got that. And we've got real doubts about whether or not the US is is going to maintain its role. And and I think leadership is so critical. I keep using that word. Um, Greg Swenson, uh, thank you so much for your thoughts uh, on this weekend of the 20th anniversary on 9-11. Really do appreciate that, Greg. Absolutely fascinating. The time is 12.47. This is Ty's Talk on Talk Radio. Online on DAB. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
This is Talk Radio. Across the UK, online, on DAB+, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk here on Talk Radio. It's 12.52. We're approaching the end of the third hour on what's been a punchy, spicy uh, series of debates. Uh, the tweets are coming in. Uh, one here from Pablo. The biggest threat to the world isn't climate change. It's Joe Biden. That's in reference to the discussion that I've just been having with uh, Greg Swenson of uh, Republican Overseas uh, about the commemorations yesterday for the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Um, but also the lessons to be learnt and the impact and the implications uh, for the, the need for strong leadership as we look forward uh, in, uh, in the global world order. You know, I've got real concerns that uh, you know, a weak, weakly-led uh, US uh, has real implications for uh, geopolitical implications for the world. We need to be able to rely on the US as the super policeman. Another tweet here from somebody else we were talking about right at the start of the show. Do you trust the government or not? And that's been, uh, in terms of the number of tweets we've had, that's certainly been uh, the strongest view. It's time for Boris to pack his bags. Uh, his time is over. Uh, he should leave, it says. The Northern Ireland Protocol alone should see him out of office. That's from Sam in Ballymena. There's no question that I think people really have got serious concerns. Uh, people who voted for Boris... It just feels as though he's not the guy that they voted uh, for back in December 2019. We've had a great debate about Cressida Dick, a former Met police officer, uh, sorry, former police officer, phoning in lots of views on that. You know, my view is that leaders have to be held accountable. We, we, we have to be, uh, you, you've got to perform. And if you have a long charge sheet of things that have gone wrong, then uh, after your five year term, why would you be reappointed? I, I find it inexplicable that Boris Johnson, the man who basically fired uh, a previous Met Commissioner when he was Mayor of London, Ian Blair, uh, he then, with the Home Secretary, says he wants continuity. Uh, and therefore, that seems it's a pretty weak reason, isn't it, to have uh, an extended term for Cressida Dick? I mean, continuity. What about because she's a brilliant leader? What about because she's doing a great job driving down crime? in London. Well, I think the truth is none of those things are the case. She clearly is someone who is good with people, uh, good with her officers, cares about her officers, which are all great leadership qualities. Um, but actually, uh, us Londoners, we want crime rates down, we want the murder rate down, we want the knife crime rate down, and we're not seeing any of that under Cressida Dick. And we had, of course, the great big debate that certainly got people going, e-scooters, keep them, ban them, or regulate them. And at that thing, that, to discuss that, well, we've just got to the point where Daryl Morris, who is taking us through the next three hours, has joined the studio. Daryl, very warm welcome to you this afternoon. Hello, How are you doing? It's nice to meet you. How are nice you? Nice to meet you too. You look very right. smart, sir. Well, I, you know, try to on a Sunday you morning. You look great. I must ask you, Daryl. Yeah. Have you tried an e-scooter? Um, I haven't tried an e-scooter, but the, I, I'm, there, I'm a little bit... Um, they're, I'm, I'm, they're sort of taking me by surprise. They sort of seem to be everywhere, don't they, these days, e-scooters? You can get them on the app, right? Is there an app you that can, you can so, use? So actually, I think I, that's so, quite a nice idea. So I had this debate yeah. between someone who actually is selling them, uh -huh. uh, who's obviously very pro them, yeah, and, you'd imagine them. Um, <laughs> and uh, a lady from the National Federation for the Blind, right. uh, you know, who actually putting in petitions to ban them. Oh, and right. we put out a Twitter poll. Mm. Um, and at the end of the debate, I said that actually, um, in order to inform myself, I had actually tried... Give the, I'd given it a go last week yeah. uh, and actually sort of I'd, I'd done the bit on the app and I'd hired it and I'd gone through the rigmarole yeah. um, it wasn't cheap I mean you know for like 10 minutes was about 4 quid oh was it really? yeah really it was right? um, but my concern was actually basically it went at about 10 miles an hour and it, I was dawdling along and I was being overtaken by Boris bikes and things. And I'm yeah. a competitive player. I thought, well, what's the point? I'm You're getting no exercise. You're a competitive bloke. And, I like that. that and, and I'm being overtaken by a bloke every from... area of your life. You can't possibly <laughs> be overtaken by a bicycle. Certainly not you know, a Boris bike. Yeah, exactly. Do you know what I haven't got? I, I'll be honest with you, which is... This doesn't happen very often, and it's not really welcome around these parts. I don't really have an opinion on them. I'm not really sure. I'm not. I just don't really. I'm not really sure how I feel about these well, users. Then, then, then the answer, surely, Darren, is to try it. I yeah, mean, give it a go. Yeah, give yeah. Give it a go. Yeah. Uh, and what what we learned through it is that these trials are going through until March next year. About fifty cities around the uh, around the UK. Right. Uh, but the the big questions is about the speed of them. 
should they be registered? What are the sanctions? You know, not using them on pavements and things. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can also understand uh, the point of view of somebody perhaps who's blind and who's struggling a yes. little bit and all that. You can you can appreciate, yes, can't yeah. you, how there's, there's uh, other considerations yeah. there. We had, so I live in Manchester during the week. Uh, uh, that's my, my home. And um, we had... We had a company, it was a Japanese company who had bikes uh, that you could hire, you know, by the minute yep. on the app. And they lasted all of about two months before and they had to gone. get rid of them. Because gone. because they were ending up in the street, you know, in the canal and stuff like gone that. Gone everywhere. Yeah. Um, well, uh, have a great show, Daryl. Thank you. Um, thank you to my production team uh, who've been amazing today. As always, uh, you've been listening to Ty's Talk here on Talk Radio. And next up, it's Daryl Morris. Online, on DAB, and on the Talk Radio. 